Good evening. Uh, welcome to our uh, 6 p.m. workshop, and we're going to be starting off here with uh, uh, the Good Food Council. If you can please uh, introduce yourself and then take it away. Thank you, Mayor Schleen, council members. Um, very uh, appreciate being able to be here today. The Good Food Council does. Um, my name is Julia Harper. Uh, for the past eight years, I have been the coordinator for the Good Food Council of Lewis and Auburn. And um, I'm going to be talking a lot, and I realize that I don't have as many slides as would be ideal, so I gave you all flowers from an urban garden in Lewiston <laughs> to um, give you something else to look at. Uh, so a little bit about the Good Food Council. Uh, they're celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. They were founded um, in response to a community food assessment, which took a deep look at the food access picture of downtown Lewiston and realized that there were, while there were many strengths, there were also um, persistent systemic challenges in terms of access to healthy and affordable local foods for many people. So um, the Food Council was founded as a way to build collaborative solutions to, uh, collaborative long-term solutions to uh, these systemic problems. So um, one of the ways that we um, create change is through um, providing nonpartisan research and educational resources in matters of public policy. And so tonight I'm here to speak on one of those projects, which is the urban agriculture ordinances in Lewis and Auburn. Um, and uh, recent, the reason why I'm here tonight is because recent circumstances in Lewiston led to the city council um, deciding to look at ordinances related to chickens and bees, which are um, you know, considered part of urban agriculture on a timeline that was faster than our project. So we wanted to um, you know, have the opportunity to come and speak to the council to let you know about this work that's been going on. So, um, so this project originated from the Local Foods, Local Places Action Plan in 2020. Uh, moving forward, I'll refer to it as LFLP. <laughs> so this is a, um, LFLP is a National Technical Assistance Program sponsored by the USDA and the EPA. Mm -hmm. And it aims to support projects that create livable, walkable, economically vibrant main streets and mixed use neighborhoods boost economic opportunities for local farmers and Main Street businesses, and improve access to healthy local food. Um, LFLP, um, there are over 100 communities in the country that have participated. And in 2019, the St. Mary's Nutrition Center applied and was selected to participate in, the, in LFLP. Uh, with support from a technical assistance team made up of federal officials, the Nutrition Center formed a steering committee of community stakeholders, which included Misty Parker, Lewiston's assistant manager for economic development. And together they planned and executed a two-day conversation and workshop uh, in October 2019. And the um, event brought together over 80 community members across municipal, business, and agricultural sectors. The, plan was then finalized in January 2020, and it serves as a record of a community planning process, a vision, and a roadmap to help our community grow and strengthen local food and farms, and a powerful tool to leverage resources uh, and more. The plan contains 16 specific action steps, of which urban agriculture ordinances is one, um, and it was selected by community participants under the goal of integrating local food and agriculture into city planning and economic development strategies. It's one of four goals. Uh, so um, the, the Good Food Council accepted the leadership role for this action. So um, then the city council adopted the LFLP plan by resolution in 2020. And uh, today, the LFLP network um, is convened by the Food Council with support from the St. Mary's Nutrition Center, and it um, continues to implement the community vision as outlined in the plan. So I will preface urban agriculture ordinance um, talk by saying that I am not a planner myself, um, but I, we did have a planner on our team. Shelly Norton is currently part of the planning staff of um, Lew the city of Lewiston and was previously a planner at AVCOG and worked with us on this project. Um, so what is urban agriculture? Um, it, you know, simply speaking, it's the cultivation of food within metropolitan areas. And it's been gaining momentum nationally as a way to address food insecurity in urban areas. 
Urban agriculture occurs at a variety of scales, ranging from backyard tomato plants to multi-acre urban farms. And um, in a city planning context, it includes rules related to farm stands, hoop houses, tool sheds, compost, farmer's market, community gardens, and more. In addition, urban agriculture has also been recognized as a mechanism to achieve other positive community impacts, including skill building, job training, community building, economic development, city greening and beautification, and environmental benefits, such as reduced urban heat island effect, improved stormwater quality and reduced quantity, and increased pollinator populations, and more. So um, global crises, <laughs> Um, such as global crises and conflicts um, of, of late have um, made clear the danger of food shortages and price volatility and other effects that render urban agriculture um, an important tool for community resilience. So, and according to the Man American Planning Association, local governments can play an important role in legitimizing urban agriculture as a recognized land use and, a community, and or a community development strategy. So the Good Food Council set out back in 2020 to practically support each city to update and or pass new urban agriculture ordinances that are responsive to community need and increase access to local foods. We had three overlapping phases of work, which were to identify uh, and study U.S. cities with successful urban agriculture ordinances and understand examples and factors that led to their success, including understanding if there were, if there were common complaints and how they were addressed. The second phase was local resident outreach, and the third phase was to produce recommend, third phase will be to produce recommendations and support citizen engagement. Our partners included city planning staff in both cities. Um, AVCOG supported planning staff time. Uh, Bates and USM have supported research, and the St. Mary's Nutrition Center has been a great partner for um, community outreach. Phase uh, one of the research took place in 2020 through 2021. And um, what we did was we reached out to a National Food Policy Council listserv to ask what cities were known nationally for urban agriculture. And um, we also asked which, which cities had also significant populations of immigrants from subsistence farming backgrounds, as this seemed like a dynamic in Lewis and Auburn that seemed like a useful point of comparison. We asked for any contacts also that, of planning staff in these cities, and um, this produced a number of recommendations. And we, um, you know, most were cities that had much larger and denser um, population-wise than Lewiston and Auburn. So we um, were interested um, to see how they had less restrictive and harmonious regulations for urban agriculture. Questions that were asked included, um, you know, what sorts of constituent pushback or complaints were received during or after ordinance passage and how were those addressed? How were, have your order, ordinances evolved? We asked what sorts of impacts have your ordinances had over time? And um, what was the public engagement strategy or process and timeline? Um, so, and you can see many of the cities listed here, um, they were not all interviewed, but all ordinances were studied. And, um, you know, the example shown here is Madison, Wisconsin, which has a population of over 200,000. Um, so, um, the second phase was outreach to local residents, and that was conducted in fall of last year and it was designed in partnership with city planning staff and it consisted of interviews, focus groups, um, and a, a survey which was done online and in person with nearly 500 responses across both cities. Um, the outreach was designed to understand the current levels of specific gardening, processing, and sales-related activities and common regulatory barriers faced in those activities, as well as identify residents that might consult on ordinance development and or champion passages of ordinances that would positively impact their food access opportunities. With the online survey, we knew we were only re reaching a specific subset of the population. Um, and so therefore, in order to make sure that we were hearing from those in our communities that face some of the largest barriers to food access, we, um, you know, including low-income residents, seniors, people of color, those whose primary language is not English, 
uh, we were awarded a small grant from the Onion Foundation to compensate six um, residents in downtown Lewiston and Auburn who were skilled in community outreach, who had established relationships with downtown communities, and um, they collectively were fluent in uh, Somali, Mai Mai, Portuguese, and English languages. Um, they conducted in-person surveys and focus groups at community gardens, farmers markets, the root cellar, the good food bus market stops, food pantries, and they knocked doors downtown and at public housing authority buildings. Um, so the targeted outreach is important because in our research we found many warnings that say it is neither inevitable nor guaranteed that urban agriculture ordinances will support food security among low-income and historically disadvantaged groups. In fact, if planning is not approached with an equity lens, it can potentially deepen um, social inequities, for example, benefiting those who already have privileges such as land and property ownership. Uh, we collected almost 500 surveys total. The demographic data of the survey respondents was compared to the census data for Lewiston and Auburn, and it was shown to reflect the um, represented sort of proportional um, populations in race, gender, and age diversity in each city. And um, broadly speaking, the two most significant results from the survey were residents in both Lewiston and Auburn are currently engaging in urban agriculture at activities, and they're interested in engaging in more in the future. Um, and that's demonstrated on this slide. Also, there is a significant lack of under, the second major observation was that there's a significant lack of understanding among residents in regards to what is and what isn't allowed as far as certain activities. Um, so this figure shows um, responses from only Lewis and residents who answered the question, do you currently have or make use of the following food related activities and infrastructure? Um, in, in Lewiston, the most common activities that residents are currently engaged in are canning and food processing and composting. And then in Auburn, I'm sorry, and then Lewiston, the most um, common activities that residents are interested in engaging in the future were chickens for eggs, fruit trees, greenhouses, and honeybees. <clears throat> Since 2020, um, oh sorry, this figure shows um, responses only from Lewiston residents who identified lack of, they identified that lack of affordable or secure access to land as their most common barrier um, for um, urban agriculture. And they also named complicated and expensive um, city permitting, complicating or expensive city permitting and zoning or land use regulations as common barriers. And we believe that the responses to this question are a mixture of both real and perceived barriers. So uh, the final phase um, is to produce recommendations and support citizen engagement. We, um, since 2020, we've presented three rounds of research findings to city planning staff and elected officials. And now we're in the final phase um, of developing a resource that details relevant findings from resident feedback, as well as recommendations on ordinance by land use, very similar to um, the recommendations we provided on chickens and bees um, a couple weeks ago. And um, it would also include farmers markets, as we've heard that that is a need. Um, and then it would also include programs and or um, communications and education uh, because we realized that in order to truly address um, food insecurity in this way, it won't all be able to be solved with ordinances. Um, so we also recently hired a graduate planning student from USM's Muskie School for the fall to um, help round out our research and recommendations. And um, we, uh, you know, in Lewiston, our understanding is that council and planning board has approved, in terms of the timeline, a workshop for, I'm sorry, a work plan for planning staff uh, that is slates the urban agriculture ordinance updates for um, 2023, and um, which we appreciate and merges really well with our timeline. 
Um, we obviously appreciate City Council consideration of the goals and needs of citizens, and we truly seek to be a resource and um, help meet these, these community needs and goals around local food access, as well as you know, any um, things supporting this food access strategy as well as others into city planning. Um, we welcome feedback from the council in our final phase, which um, you know, we don't have an exact timeline, but certainly this fall. And um, we, uh, you know, we seek to produce something useful, so this is a great opportunity for council to share anything that we should be kind of including in our, in our final phase. And um, with that, questions and comments. <laughs> Councillor Harriman. Thank you. Um, thank you for presenting. I just had a question about, um, are there any programs that you know of that help to educate and provide resources for people who want to garden, um, considering all the lead contamination in our soil? Mm -hmm. um, I, that some people don't even know, um, and then others maybe don't know what to do. So I, I just wonder if there are any resources or programs out there that you know of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So St. Mary's Nutrition Center, of course, has the Lots to Gardens program that they support people with um, lots of education and free um, land or you know free garden plots and supplies and tools, uh, as well as you know they, they all of their gardens are very you know lead remediated. I also am aware that the Cumberland County um, Soil and Water Conservation District has like um, a, a program. It's for Cumberland County, but they have sort of a um, a sort of drop and drag like um, program around, it, like I think they would be a great resource in, in terms of lead remediation education. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm just so excited about this, I'm sorry. I, I canned 82 pounds of tomatoes this weekend, so this is obviously <laughs> right up my alley. Um, I think this is great. The work that you're doing is great. I would like to suggest possibly with what Councillor Harriman just asked about that maybe we get the University of Maine Cooperative Extension involved where they do soil testing all the time and maybe in, we can figure something out on how we can use that to look at some of the soil in the community. Um, I would also like to see if maybe we can work on some more allotment spaces for gardening and not just in the immediate downtown area but outside of the downtown area. I know that there are many people I currently work on two gardens outside of my own for older citizens in my neighborhood who their, their kids asked me if I could do it, they couldn't do it this year, and I was like, absolutely. And I think that if we could maybe build that program also, we might get a lot more people doing the gardening and working on that. And then I'd also like to encourage and be a part of, if you want me to, um, helping with canning and preserving. I think that that is a big part of helping with our food insecurity. We need folks to understand how to do that work for themselves, how to cook properly for themselves, and I think that we'll see a big difference on needs and food insecurity in our community when people know how to shop properly and preserve their own food. So, and I appreciate all that you're doing, thank you. I appreciate that so much, and uh, I just wanted to add that um, the, the survey in sort of the focus groups, a lot of residents talked about being able to um, be able to garden on vacant, you know, more, more obviously a lack of, lack of affordable access to land is huge in Lewiston, and, um, you know, people identified vacant lots as a potential opportunity. Further comments from the council? Uh, anything else you'd like to add, um, Julia? No, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you for the flowers. flowers. <laughs> and thank you for the flowers. <laughs> and now I would like to uh, invite uh, our Director of Public Works uh, for the next uh, workshop. If you can uh, both introduce yourself. Let me do my technology. Mary Ann Brancheck, the Director of Public Works. Megan Bates, Deputy for Maintenance and Operations. Didn't 
do it right yet. It's coming. Great. Thank you for uh, having me here on this such a big topic like parks. So we'll be kind of scratching the surface a little bit. I sent you a preview email to kind of get a look at some of these parks. I didn't even know what they were. So, you know, kind of get a visual on them um, to see what we're doing with the parks that we have and see how big of a topic it is. You know, we're not including the athletic fields, the cemeteries, and the other pieces that come under these divisions. And both of these divisions come under Megan. Um, so it's, you know, open spaces and trees. Uh, we're very lucky to have three licensed arborists in our staff. Um, so we have a lot of talent. Uh, two team leaders lead these groups. Um, and so what we're going to do tonight is just kind of look at that big picture on what's happening with the two rec conversions, what that really means, because it's been so many years, a lot of the public has been asking questions to what that is. And so I have some brief si slides on that, um, which you know involves two parks that we're trying to recreate. And I'll explain that a little bit more. And then I have a very short update on the Cody Street Park, a little bit on the survey that we did, and then schedule ahead for when the planning board would be looking at this for another public process. And I know there may be a few people that want to speak on that, and just to remind them that at the beginning of the council meeting at 7 is when they can speak on that. So not to be frustrated that they can't speak at the workshop, but they will be the first ones up as soon as the meeting starts. And then lastly, just looking at parks maintenance. And Megan and her staff did a great job. It's a big, long spreadsheet. I sent that to you. Councillor LaChapelle probably read every bit of it. But there's lots of different categories. There was 22 different categories of where we spend our time. And we do look at all of this. And this was a good exercise that was valuable to us as well. I kind of looked at a really hard look at what defines a park. Like Dufresne Plaza is a park to us. Um, there might be a small one with a couple flags and a bench, but it's dedicated to a certain person. It's still a park. So Megan warned me on renaming anything. <laughs> Just that they've been there for a long time. And we came up with the 22 that are shown on your map that I handed out to you, which gives you a little bit of a visual. A lot of them are downtown, but a little bit more spread out. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what we can kind of cover in a half an hour. Again, we're meeting one of your goals. One of your three, four, I think four top goals is improve the image of the city. And what open space and parks and trees do every day is that. You know, so it's, it's an important goal and we want to tie that back to, you know, what you have for goals. Parks in general, we think is a big picture. Um, you'll see in the, in the uh, story map that I sent you and that will be available on the parks website for the Public Works City website, is that parks is more than just healthy. It's an economic driver. It's also a social piece where our mental health, where we look at COVID and what did everybody want to do, get outside, and really kind of looked at the importance of that as being a part of health. Um, so it's a little bit more than pretty green space. And the statistics are there. I mean, there's some survey points here. We'll see more of our local survey points with the survey that we did. We had 378 people for just the Cody Street Park. Well, there were some general questions of what did you feel about parks. We'll get some of that information from the Riverfront Update Master Plan that we're underway right now. That has a little bit better of a public outreach process where people can click on a spot in town and make a suggestion. So we hope to use that resource more for some of our um, outre outreach. But think about it. the way. Before we used to have a meeting, 30 people would show up maybe, and that would be it. That would be the only people we hear from. So really making an effort to do more public outreach and get more creative with that. So a rec conversion. A rec conversion boils down to, if you get money from the federal government for a grant to improve a park, it has to be a park forever. Forever, which, you know, coming from an economic development family, that's hard to do. I mean, your uses change, your needs change, especially with in-town urban areas. So when they decided to put in Connor School, they displaced some parklands that had gotten some federal money. So we had to replace those. Um, it's a long, arduous process where it has recreational value and land value. Land value, pretty easy. I call Bill Healy and he tells me what it is. Recreational value is pretty subjective and there's no description on what that is. So. Not liking that, we're trying to push back as much as we can. Um, and then for the other big picture around rec conversions is that 
you know, our administrator, Hunter, has been working with other communities that also have rec conversion requirements to fight back at a national level and at a state level to these requirements that you'll see don't always make sense for the best picture long term. So, you know, we're trying to do something about that as well, but we are stuck in this. Um, this was reviewed uh, 2020. We got a letter back saying these five sites are approved. So it took two years for it to go up to the federal government, review areas, and accept these five sites. So we started doing them. Uh, so the first three are done. I mean, Druin Park, I think, was just a private park that was made public. Some kind of paperwork just switched hands. Jude's Place, beautiful, you know, so that was done. And then the Bartlett Field soccer field. So the soccer field was part of this conversion. The sledding hill was not. Okay, so there's different pieces of that park. And then, of course, the athletic complex is up above. Um, so now that whole complex, McGraw Park, and the athletic complex is pretty big. But only the soccer field counted as that great conversion because it was approved. So the other two that are approved is the Cody Street Park, which is Natural Elements Park. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the other one was Ployd. So on the corner of Ployd and Webster or Weber, it's a W. Webster. Webster. It, when we looked at the original uh, starting some design plans, there was so many wetlands there. And what happened is when they rebuilt Alfred Ployd, the road used to go through there, they had to swap wetlands. So when they filled in wetlands to make that road, so that added extra restrictions onto that lot besides the natural wetlands and vernal pools and stuff. So it would have been a very boring, simple, short path through there that we didn't think had enough value to be a $700,000 parks project. So we're looking for something else. And again, still, still working on that. So again, like I said, these are three rules. Besides it being a park forever, it couldn't already have been funded as a capital project, like the pickleball court. We argued that for a while to see if we could get that in, because it hasn't been built yet. It's very wanted in the community, as much as you want me to delete parks. I'm not deleting that one. We're actually under design now, for those of you pickleball lovers. Um, and so it can't already be a park that you're going to improve either. So we looked at that. You, you can't improve an existing park. And again, that equivalency of the recreational and land values. One's hard to figure out, a little subjective, and one's pretty clean. Um, so right now, we, we're trying to do that with that third project. The deadline to complete these projects was August 23rd. So that's why both the Cody Street Employed projects were funded for next year's capital, this year's design. Um, if we decide to, you know, like we have decided not to do Ployd, we have to go through another whole federal process of doing a rec conversion within a conversion. Um, could take a year to two years to be approved. So we wanted to do, uh, again, more public process up front, where originally when these five projects were picked, they looked at city lots and made their best choices. They didn't have public process. So it felt a little bit behind the ball when we got to Cody Street and you know we we're at the end of that and, and still trying to work through some public process with that, but it was never done at the beginning. I feel bad about that. That's just, what, that's just how it was submitted. Um, but they were looking at the best city-owned lots that they could do and trying to spread them out. So when we look at a conversion for Ployd, we have three alternatives of city lots. Each one of them has their own challenges, like everything in public works, I guess. <laughs> is there's one that we own out on Bradbury Road. Um, it's a, it would, again, be natural trails, but it actually would add some access to no-name pond, which the city doesn't have right now. It's all private property. So the, the state level parks uh, advisor for us loves that, that it could be accessed for people that need to walk two miles to get to it. But you're not going to get that pull up, you know, let's have a party here out of the back of our car. You're not going to get that kind of a crowd. They need to hike in there. Um, it's used uh, and overseen by the Androscoggin Land Trust for us right now in very cool projects where they rebuilt vernal pools in there that we would protect and work around which is a great educational thing because there's great pitches on how those were actually built. So it's kind of cool. The other site we wanted to look at was the end, very end of East Avenue. If, if some of you aren't familiar with that, there's a reservoir at the end. We take pretty good care of it. We use it for pipes and lay down area, but it's all fenced in for nobody to use. Mm -hmm. It abuts the, um, the nature reserve, Thornton, Thorn Craig. So there's some possibilities there. Again, challenges around safety around that water. Um, there is a reservoir there, but you do a fish and derby or something like that, you'd have to have some safety pieces. 
And then the last project is really looking at Island Point, which is part of the Riverfront Master Plan update to look at could it, it's a restricted use of what that lot can be. There's environmental concerns over there, but could it be a park? Could it be a scenic vista? Could it be another whatever educational site? Um, again, every one of those has challenges. <laughs> So we're, we're looking at the first one with the least amount of challenges and just looking at making sure that there isn't any environmental restrictions that we can't create a path. So we've met with DEP, we've met with Army Corps. Um, the next stages we'll be meeting with the butters and kind of talking through some of the things that we'd like to do there. But we want to get through those Army Corps permitting pieces first to see is it possible. It takes a little bit longer, but I think it's better in the end. Again, so just kind of, um, I don't know how I jumped right into uh, the conversion there. But this goes into the Cody Park. I think these slides got mixed up a little bit, but we had three public meetings for Cody Park. Um, again, after the fact, so didn't have a good taste in people's mouths right from the beginning, but we're really doing the best we can to kind of show what the intent is there. Um, we've been working with a group of about 30 people that had the first on-site meeting to keeping them updated, so we've sent group emails to that group. Um, we had a pub, two public meetings with PVA. We didn't get a lot of representation at that first meeting, so we wanted to meet on-site in their uh, community room. I, and Megan went to the day one, and there was probably 10, 12 people there, and I went to the evening one, and nobody showed up. So they did add some comments to the survey, um, but they you know, weren't showing up for meetings, so it's hard to get feedback without you know, having the conversations. But four, what do I got, five or six you know, recommendations that came from citizens. Um, again, a lot of the ones around safety were directed to the police department, which we'd worked very closely with. What we've done is, you know, included some lighting in the parking area and also the removable bollards, sort of like we have at Samard Payne Park, where the police would be able to get in there if they needed to, but it's restricted for other vehicles. So that was some of the requests that they had there, and we talked about a gate. We wasn't really sure how to have a gate on that, but still under consideration. It will be as much ADA able as possible um, and kind of looking at benches along the way, things like that where people could stop and just kind of hang out and you know, n not interfere with clearing too much, but just along the path. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes you just want to sit, sort of like Thorn Craig, I love that where you can just sit and write or read or just relax. Um, they didn't want, uh, the residents didn't want other trailheads besides the Ashmont one being the primary, and that's what showed in the survey as well. So we've minimized anything coming in from the other neighborhoods. It would just be a, a neighborhood connection and not a lot of signage or amenities at those areas, just minimal uh, to kind of downplay just for the neighbors that are in that area to come from that. And if someone's coming from another part of the city, they use the parking lot on Ashmont Street. Uh, minimal clearing and the environmental piece is all part of the natural elements to begin with. We'll clear as little as possible um, and really use some of those natural environmental pieces for education. And then again, of course, adding the, the off-street parking. The survey you've all seen a while ago, we've sent this survey to that whole group that was at the first meeting. It's you know, available for anybody who wants a copy. It's like 75 pages long, but it does show you every single individual comment that people made. Um, we got some general uh, you know, statistics on looking at the results. What was most interesting to us was the open-ended questions. You know, what, what would you like to see? What are your thoughts that we didn't ask you a specific question about? And 43% of those were positive. 11% didn't want it. And 46 were pretty neutral, answering the rest of the questions, but could go either way. Um, so that was out of 378. Like I said, we've kind of grown from going from a single meeting of maybe 30 people in a room to trying to do more outreach with a digital survey and posters with a Q code in the locations that you know the park is located so that people with a cell phone could grab it and do the survey. So again, hope to get more for the Riverfront Master Plan update than uh, you know, looking at that new public outreach software that we have. This is a light drawing of the new uh, parking lot. So they asked for less clearing, so we're gonna bring it in a little bit deeper to give it a little bit more room in the flat area that's already cleared. And the natural trail itself is just being developed. The specialty designer of that uh, was just starting work on it in August. So we won't see much more about what elements those are until we get to the planning board stage. Um, the lighting is shown in here. Um, and that's about it, really, just looking at 
the playground will be right off to that other cleared area. I think it says play area right there. So just below that, where the trees naturally are already cleared, is we try to work around those areas. And it gives, it's, it's climbing on logs, it's rocks, it's you know, natural element species. So then to just wrap up, looking, trying to find how much time I have. Five minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes is kind of going over maintenance because I think those were a lot of questions that the counselors have had. I don't know about the public, but I know that you all have had a lot of questions about that. Um, the spreadsheet did detail down each particular park and what was spent for each one of those categories. So all 22 of those categories are on this big spreadsheet. And some don't have trees, some don't have parks equipment, you know, so there's lots of those different pieces that tie into that. Those are our two team leaders, Steve Merch and Al Patno. Um, in, the, in the Arborist Division, we have three staff with one new that was approved in the fiscal, this new fiscal year, budget year, um, who also has landscape arborist experience, so we got a great candidate for that position. And then Al works with eight full-time staff and then seasonal staff. And, and we did have problems filling our seasonal staff this year. Um, we're used to them all leaving to go back to college, so you know it's kind of a short season. They leave in the middle of August, but really didn't even fill all the positions we have. So we're, we're trying to find better ways to do that. Whether it's you know somebody who just wants to work one day a week or two days a week, we're trying to be creative with that and, and find people that can fit some of these niches of just taking care of the flowers or a couple of the specific entrances that we spend a lot more time on. Um, and again, all of this and everything in your spreadsheet doesn't include athletics fields, cemeteries, roadside, or other green spaces. It, it's just what we call parks. This was interesting and a great exercise. You know, it's always a great exercise to get pushed to do these things, is looking at what were the top five parks. I was a little surprised. You know, and I, and I think a lot of it is litter pickup, and that was calculated as well. Um, Kennedy and Samard, no surprises, right? Um, but Dufresne Plaza takes a lot of work to keep up. It's beautiful right now. <laughs> so we can say that, you know, it is a showpiece for us. Veterans Park, I, I think I put in my memo to you, I thought, you know, a lot of volunteer work was done there, but it really is the city doing 99% of that. Um, and the Mike McGraw Park and its growth. Um, again, some of it's just seasonal. You may have noticed the sledding hill. We're not doing anything during the summer on the sledding hill. So, you know, might plant some wildflowers or something like that, but not trying to add, because that's kind of just a winter amenity. Um, the medium-sized parks, probably not surprised with Jude's Place. We've had some equipment um, replacement there that has been problems, but it looks good. We repaired a banking over there this summer. Parity Park is a really tough one, needs some work. Um, we've got a new sewer line going down through there, so we'll leave it better than we found it, but it still needs a little bit of work. Um, Pentongill School, um, even though the capital programs are paid by that Friends of Pentongill Park, we do the maintenance there. So that fills, falls into that medium category. The Potvin Park, Lionel Potvin Park is right before the bridge. It's got to play equipment and then the Greenway Trail. So the, those were 10 out of the 22 that were listed. And what I, I thought was helpful in this is that as is expected, those five large parks take up 60% of the time. As, as they should, I think. You know, when you look at where do you want the flowers, where do you want those trees trimmed up, later where do you want Christmas lights, they come into that area. Uh, the medium parks take 20% and then the other 12 areas take 20%. So time management wise, I think we're in, a, in the place where we should be. You know, that isn't, more isn't needed, but I think we're, you know, we're focusing on our big parks that are the signature places for us. Somebody had a question about what we don't do anymore. Um, so Steve Merch put this list together that looked at areas that used to have flowers, um, areas where there'd be a little bit more repeat maintenance during the week. Um, and so each one of those categories were made for different reasons. Uh, those decisions were made by you know, Megan and her staff and the ability to, to do these. And those are rotating all the time. Um, like the one that we put back on the list, um, you know, the Lone Bridge Monument. Um, that's important. Um, it should have been do done all along. We're not sure why they got off the list. So it, it made us take a look at those ones that we weren't doing. There's an island that comes in off the island right there, and the staff thought that was an MDOT project because the bridge 
was an MDOT project and they just left it that way, but it, it is adopted by us when they leave. So we cleaned that up as well. Um, when we finish the Continental Trail that comes to that lone monument, it'll look beautiful. But what happens when those mills aren't developed yet is that we still need to maintain something there. Uh, and so not sure what you might want to see moving around on those lists, but it, it was a request, so I think it was kind of a good exercise too to sign, see where do, we, where do we want to switch something out of those lists or get them back on, or what do we want to take off, those kind of areas. Certainly, you know, we showed in our budget last year that we needed two new employees in this division. We got one, we're still going to request. We've got some new areas that are coming on, on board, including the art pieces. So that's another piece that adds a landscape area around every one of those art pieces, which is great. I think it's important, um, but it adds more work. And so we've carefully planted those this year to be more grasses, to be as low maintenance as possible. Steve was a big part of choosing some of those pieces. Um, and it cleaned up some of those ugly lots. So, I mean, the arts were, you know, the art pieces were definitely um, going to be beautiful and just getting installed now. We have the first one getting installed down at McGraw Park next week. And Megan's been coordinating all of those pieces. Um, so great with that money coming from economic development, but those are all areas that we need to maintain now. And the last piece I just wanted to say to the public a little bit about what's this green print and this storyboard that we have shared with the council and will be on our website for sharing is really kind of bringing back that point that parks are better than pretty green spaces. You know, they're an economic driver. People choose where they want to live, where they want to work by the green space that's around them and the social benefits and the mental health benefits. And even just talking and listening to Julia's presentation, where some of those areas we could do more gardens with. You know, so um, a lot of different benefits here and, and what that includes. And that's kind of a, that's map speak, if you want to <laughs> know where that word came from. So we have a new um, GIS technician, Ashley Gamage, who did this project and hopefully you enjoyed that. It's something that we'll maintain and keep up um, and it's mobile friendly so people can do it from on the, on the run. So that's what that looks like and we're ready to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, thank you both very much, and thanks you, thank you to your entire department for um, yeah keeping up these spaces. Uh, and I really, you know, I saw this in the packet, uh, this map. I'm really guys glad um, this was made. So I spent um, quite a bit of Saturday uh, visiting one through 21 <laughs> on this. Wow. Uh, so I visited uh, 21 city parks uh, over the weekend, uh, all on Saturday. I, I had been to to many of them, you know, with my kids and you know just for recreation. Um, I didn't realize we had so many parks, and there were parks I never even knew that they were there. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, comments or questions from the council? Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, so if we can go back to the page where you listed the staff shortages and some of the areas. So when you look at the annual beds not planted in 2020 through 2022, is there any thoughts to doing those again or is that still a staff that you're continuing to keep that your thoughts are to continue to keep those not maintained at this point it's forward. still a juggling game you know when we have something that is going on in a certain area we'll shift some people over there to 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 look at building that up but not starting to replant areas that we have taken out of the mix there's a flower budget as well that's a limitation, but Megan can probably answer more about right. And, and until we can get um, some of our temporary or seasonal staff up and hired, we, we will have no means, no way of being able to maintain those lots that have been vacant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then on the next box over, where it says landscape areas we walked away from in 2020 haven't been back. So. Who's been maintaining that? I'm thinking specifically like the Nelke Place dead end where you can see that when you're driving on Russell Street where that planted area is. And then also um, on the Farwell Street corner and stuff. Who is, has anybody been taking care of that? Because some of this does not look that like it hasn't been maintained in a long time. Some of it looks like somebody's still do you know if that, that's that could neighborhood? Be, that could be or could be reseeding itself. But okay. yeah, if, if uh, Steve is saying they walked away, uh, we, are not, we are not maintaining those any longer. And Might be some neighbors. 
Okay, so, and just one more point, please. So, I, I think this is pretty significant when you look at this page and we talk about um, the image of our city and our community. I know that we're very lucky to have several people that are community members that just go and do some projects at parks. We have the Downtown Lewiston Association that did a fantastic job this year, mm -hmm. making sure that all of last those year. planting was done, yeah, and last year mm -hmm. through COVID and everything on, on Lisbon Street. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when I go to other communities and I see like, I'll just say Brunswick, where they've got all those beautiful planters and all of that work done, it makes me want to get out of my car and walk around. So I'm hoping that in the future, and when we're looking at this, it's not necessarily the specific parks, but when we look at the beautification of our city, when we look at like that piece on at the end of Nelke Street where you drive by on Russell Street and you see where that nice planted area is, or the corner of Webster Street and Farwell Street, or the neighborhood signs, where it says, you know, Webster Street neighborhood and those other areas, I, I really think that that's kind of something we need to look at, how we can maintain that, and I don't know, maybe find volunteers. I, as you both know, I do Sunnyside Park and Jaden's Garden Bed every single year, mm -hmm. and there's a couple other folks in that neighborhood that help me with that so that we are able to maintain that. Maybe this is something that we can reach out to the community and put it out there that we, if we can have some people that want to work on some of these areas in their neighborhoods and we can have the support of public works and ensuring that they're reaching out to you, Megan, before they, you know, are doing anything, I would like to see us move forward in that direction, if at all possible. Right, and, and if those um, volunteer groups can have crew leaders, that helps us also. Correct. Um, we have, have what, I'm sorry? Crew leaders. If oh, these crew. volunteers can have crew leaders, you know, or a head person, that's, that's a big help to us also. Right. Um, we've worked with Friends of Pattengill. We've had a great relationship with them. They've done a lot of good work right. in that park. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor LaChapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Director, for coming forward on this. I've been saying it for a while. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, number one, I, I guess I didn't see that spreadsheet. What is the annual cost, total cost, of operating these parks? We didn't put a num We didn't put a dollar number on that. But we can um, get that to you, though. The, that the was budget. one of my questions mm -hmm. way back. I'd like to know an annual cost for the parks. Um, and yes, Public Works is doing an awesome job. I commend them for the staff that you have. You're doing a real good job. I'm just trying to balance. Um, how many government subsidized parks do we have in the city of Lewiston that we took money for that have to stay perpetually a park forever? That's a good question too, Megan, yeah. do you know? Should I don't, we can, but we, again, we can get some of that information. So, so when I hear that Carson we did, is, when you did the, yeah. when we put the school there, that we displaced the park, and then we needed to replace that acreage. Mm -hmm. So how many acres behind, the, is it acreage or is it dollar amount or what is it that we have to replace? The acreage isn't square foot by square foot because there's different values of land in different parts of town in different situations. So it's the value of that acreage. Okay. Um, and then the recreational value, like I said, is very subjective okay. to whether they think so, it meets or not. Thank you. So, how many? So, what do we exa exactly? What do we have to replace? So, we have to have, have ten acres of walking land, or or two hundred feet of exercise. Uh, what do we have to replace? In the rec conversion memo that I gave you, there's a listing of what was at that existing park from, like, I think it was an above ground pool, but they call it a beautiful pool and a walking trail and a tennis courts and. They list out everything that was amenities at, at the Connor School location, what was there that we well, need to replace. But yeah, there are other parks in other parts of the city that were taken out yeah, also. So, yeah. That were part of that. Ground. It was Marcotte Park that had mm -hmm. a ground a ground ground, above where, ground pool at one yes, time. Yes, and there was yeah. also one on Lincoln Street called Couture Park. Correct. Back in the day. So we got federal funding for that? Yes, we did. That was one of the parks. Couture on Lincoln was one. Yes. Okay. Are there any federal funding parks in the pipeline coming Garsland to Bog is the one that we have a grant on right now. We've gotten two phases for that, correct? One phase at one this phase. point. One just phase. So yeah, Garsland just one Bog phase is the current one funded from a and federal grant that, that has to be a park forever, but it's a wetlands. Will, will that cover some of the stuff that we're... Then why are we taking the federal money? 
because it's grant funded and it's something that we wanted to do. It's that Garsland Bog was already started as an above ground trail, but that wasn't a grant. I didn't know oh. that was one, but yeah. Okay. So what happens if we just don't we look build a that. park? We get no more grant funding and can't apply for grant funding. Um, it takes away from the park grant funding that we have. So it isn't going to take away the parks that we have. They no, just but we get no more grant funding for parks. Right, for parks. And there's three different categories in that rec memo that define the, the, mm -hmm. the grants that come from um, the National Park Service. One was trails, um, parks. One was, a, you know, millions of dollars, the new green space park money um, that are for mega projects. Okay. So it will also impact any funds for trails. Mm -hmm. For trails. Mm -hmm. well, we have a city that half of the city acreage is wooded to start off with. Half of the, half of the acreage in the city of Lewiston is wooded. So I live up by No Name Pond. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd, I'd like that information gotten back. Yeah, the, no, the, good the, point. That mm -hmm. dollar amount when we start looking at budgets. Yeah. And lastly, the park that we were, that the city just purchased some land to put. Is, is that the Cody Street Park? That, the, that was city-owned property already. It was going to be a development, and that was fought against for the neighborhood. So, but we just didn't. You're talking about in the square, oh, oh yeah, the square yeah, yeah, in yeah, the that middle. little house yes. lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. The square. Correct. In the yes. Yeah. We just purchased some land in there. Right. And then it was determined that we couldn't do what we wanted to do in there. Correct. No, we can do what we want to do in there. That's that's a lot. That's another dry spot that we now have when we look at natural elements and clearing less around the parking lot. We can have some play elements at the end of the trail and then be able to loop back around. And there was only paper streets going to it, so there was no access there to that lot. But we purchased some land from somebody. Yeah, in, he had a lot in the middle of that park. Now, does that go towards any of this land that we need to? Could. That, I think of it as a little block. That could get credit. That could get credit. We didn't put that in front of them yet as an option because we haven't given them the next review of the plan, but we will add that in um, to look at what value or credit could we get for that. So it has to be evaluated at the state level. So yeah, good point. I appreciate everything you're doing. It's just very difficult, as you know, it's making those decisions on do I spend money on another park or do we spend money to, for a new fire department mm -hmm. or to add a couple more police officers or to add a couple more teachers. It's a very difficult balancing act. You do mm -hmm. a fine job on what you're doing. I'm not trying to pick on it, but obviously you have to cut everywhere. Everything mm -hmm. has to get cut. And with half of our city, it's already wooded as it is. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow. And particularly, I, I get a feeling that that um, total park dollar amount is going to be quite large. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. Thank like I said, the pickleball court is the only one that's not within any grant money and is additional as new, new city property being developed into a park. OK. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Harriman. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation and, and all you do. Um, I use at least one of the parks a couple times a week. Um, and I, yeah, I just really appreciate that we have so many options to pick from. Thanks. Uh, Councillor um, Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps we should give a thought to uh, Councillor uh, Clement. Yeah. Try it. There we go. Uh, perhaps we should give thought to a program that some other municipalities utilize called, I believe, Adopt a Spot. Mm -hmm. See if we can get some volunteers to take care of some of these areas. That has been a a goal of this council. We've talked about it many times. Beautification of the city. I understand. Uh, Public Works is not the only department in the city that is suffering from lack of workers. Uh, our public safety departments suffer. Uh, and certainly public safety has got to come ahead of parks. Uh, I think that's just common sense. But if we could get some volunteers involved, mm -hmm. perhaps set up a formal program mm -hmm. for adopt a spot. I'm sure there are people out there that would be willing to assist us on that. Mm -hmm. And you see these little signs put an adopt a spot. Uh, the XYZ Street neighborhood, and uh, we we have that on our work. website now. It just it needs some marketing, because that marketing person gets started, 
You know what I mean? It, it needs the sad puppy dog shortly, eyes. Then. Adopt me. We might be able to do something about that mm -hmm. very shortly. Yeah, I put Thank that you. on my list too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Peace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. I have a question. When you add landscaping areas, how is that determined? How is that derived? Like what's the newest landscaping area that we've added? Do you want to, do you want to know like the definition of or? Oh, no, I want to know how it comes about. You're talking about the list. Right. One of the how it, items came, how it came out or how it goes on? No, how it came out? what was added. Yeah, I, I looked at these, Megan, I think is what he's asking about. I'm not sure how these got added. I know how McGraw Park and Kennedy Park entrance got added, but these North Temple, Old Green, Jefferson and Karen. I'm most particular, and I mentioned it to you before, is that the one on uh, Jefferson and Karen? Yeah. That's part of Jude's place. I think it's just um, some landscaping trees that he, he installed in there is what he's referring to. But uh, I can they check. put an island in. Is that where there's a trap? Yes, okay, that's right. Crazy it's a, it's a very island. small, that, that, that's right. It's rather than pave it or pave it and paint it green, uh, like a lot of other islands in the city of Lewiston and other municipalities, they're making green spaces out of the islands. And there's a tiny little island there. And that's what that landscape area is. Okay. First off, there was no island there to begin with. That there was added. There wasn't, but that traffic, it changed a bit, that section when they, they reconstructed it. And nobody was informed about it. Nobody was asked about it. You've got to drive that area more often. I know you said you, you had a high turn taking curve. the right turn, right? Coming you down the street trailer. trying to take a right with a trailer. Yeah, it's, you're running over it all the time. Uh, I just think we should have been notified. Well, maybe it was done before I was on, but I think people should be notified if they're going to be adding anything like that in the area. Mm -hmm. Take a look uh, and it's like I asked you about uh, either installing speed bumps or something on, uh, on Karen and on uh, Marquette to slow these people down. Uh, all that curb did was make them speed up. It slowed them down and now they're trying to make up time. That's a raceway. It really is. Uh, I think we ought to look into, if we're going to do anything, add some speed bumps. That's something that is slowing down. We'll put that into our traffic committee. We meet once a month on what areas need attention for looking at speed. We work with the PD on that. Um, we'll add those to our list. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, uh, I think that's time. Thank you both very much. And uh, yes, please tell everyone at Public Works, thank you. We will uh, start in just a few minutes.
Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, Lucent City Council meeting this evening. Uh, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll be led by uh, Miss Andrew Scoggin, uh, Gabrielle Barrett. Yes, great job, thank you. <laughs> so we're starting off uh, this evening with a new program that the council is doing called Lewiston Leads, where uh, myself and each member of the council uh, recognize um, uh, somebody who's um, done um, uh, outstanding uh, work in their community. I'm going to uh, start things off, and if I can invite uh, Clara Tammany to come forward. Hello. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining me this evening. This evening, I am pleased to recognize Claire Tammany for impactful work in the Lewiston community through her leadership roles in the Center for Wisdom's Women and Sophia's House. Clara's story is one of determination to keep alive some of the most crucial services in our neighborhoods. In 2008, the Center for Wisdom's Women didn't have enough funding to continue their work. Clara courageously stepped in and became the executive director in 2009, rallying the community, collaborating, collaborating with Trinity Church, and raising enough money to save the organization for marginalized women. Guided by faith and the strong passion to make this small part of a world a better place, she has cultivated a safe community for women, healing from trafficking, exploitation, substance use, and incarceration. Close to 3,000 women have gone through their doors and found a place to build a safe community and connect to crucial resources, all while having the support of other women. Continuing this work, Clara raised an impressive $1.6 million to open Sophia's house in 2019, a long-term residential home designed for healing and supporting the most vulnerable women who come through their center. Even when the pandemic hit, she worked hard and creatively to keep the house open and was able to maintain the center support networks during a very challenging time. Especially now, with the recent uncertainty around women's health and LGBTQ rights, marginalized groups need to be supported more than ever, and Clara's work with the Center for Wisdom's Women and Sophia's House has been an incredible force of good in the circles that need it the most. Clara's advocacy should never fly under the radar, and I am so happy that I could recognize her dedication this evening. Let's give her a round of applause. We have, uh, I, I forgot it, but we have a special uh, challenge coin for you. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to present to you uh, a challenge coin from the, Lewis, from the city of Lewiston. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. And I do want to say I have raised 1.7 million by myself. <laughs> it was the city that did it, all of you. Thank you. We're going to get it. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, just wait. Oh. Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, so I didn't write a speech because I'll be very honest and frank. I forgot that this was happening tonight. <laughs> but I was able to get who I had thought of immediately when we started talking about this program to come this evening. So Josh Nagin, would you please join <laughs> me up here? So when this was first discussed by the city council and I started thinking about it. I honestly didn't have to think but maybe a second 
to nominate Josh Nagin for my ward. Um, Josh's work with the Androscoggin Land Trust, with building the farmer's market in our community, the work that he's done in Sunnyside neighborhood, the cleanup work that he's done on our river walk, the pride that he is bringing to Sunnyside neighborhood and all the folks that live there, and the amount of cleanup and volunteer work that he does in our community, as well as being on the Downtown Lewiston Association. He's also on the planning board, and I will readily admit that and when I want to do a project in Ward 1, Josh is the first person I call because I know Josh is going to say, okay, what are we doing, Linda? So I am very, very happy tonight to honor you with our Lewiston leads and to be the first person in Ward 1 to receive this. Thank you very much. <laughs> So mine's short and sweet, um, and I'm honoring a, an organization. So if you both want to come up, that's fine, or, or just one of you. <laughs> so this month, I'd like to recognize the REST Center, uh, led by Director Tiana Warner, for being a leader in our community. From their location on Main Street, the REST Center serves our friends and neighbors who are in recovery whether that's from addiction, abuse, trafficking, or other trauma. The acronym REST stands for Recovery, Employment, Support, and Training. And among the services the REST Center provides are a drop-in center, a clothing closet, employment resources, training, social support, and simply providing a judgment-free place to help people not have to go through their recovery alone. I'm glad to present them with this Lewiston Challenge coin which symbolizes their positive impact in Lewiston and challenges others to become engaged as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, another round of applause for uh, our Lewiston leaders here. I am now excited to recognize the hard work that made um, the Park and Kennedy Pool happen uh, this year. So uh, I would invite the uh, Lewiston Rec Department to come up, Lewiston <laughs> Public Works, and it's in the agenda, there is a typo, we need to flip the M around. It is the YWCA. If you can please all join me up at the front. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Nicole Welsh, uh, our director of uh, Lewis and Rec. Did you, did you bring anybody? I brought Abby Dulek, who was the director of the pool for the summer. Abby Dulek, who's the director of the pool. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Melina Ganyan from the YWCA, thank you for being here. And did you, uh, who did you uh, bring? So this is Melissa Jackson, she's our COO, and we share Abby, Abby's the YWCA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa Jackson. We also have um, uh, Director Brenchik and uh, Deputy Director um, Bates here. Thank you so much from Public Works. And now I would like to read the proclamation. Uh, recognizing the 2022 community effort to restore use of the Com Kennedy Park Pool, whereas this summer the children of our community benefited from a revitalized Kennedy Park Pool due to the collaborative efforts of the Lewiston Recreation, YWCA Central Maine and Lewiston Public Works, and whereas opening and sustaining pool operations after being out of service for a lengthy period of time was vast in nature to include repairs, cleaning, and daily water testing, and whereas service of the pool continued throughout the summer to include 224 hours of maintenance, and whereas admits a 20,000... Admits to 2022 lifeguard shortage, the YWCA Central Maine was literally a lifesaver by providing de dedicated lifeguards to ensure oversight and safety at the pool, and whereas a total of 924 free memberships were established for pool use with over 2,100 check-ins for a total of 100 
and 10 hours of public swim contact time. And whereas youth engagement also included scheduled swimming time by Tree Street Youth, the Boys and Girls Club, the YWCA, and Camp Smiles. And whereas Kennedy Park Pool use by area youth is so much more than just swimming and cooling off in the hot weather, but also provides exercise, socialization, education, and life skills. And whereas swimming at the pool with friends and family also creates timeless memories and strengthens community connections. Now therefore, I, Carl L. Shaleen, the Mayor of City of Lewiston, do hereby officially recognize the collaborative efforts of Lewiston Recreation, YWCA Central Maine, and Lewiston Public Works to ensure a positive, enjoyable resource for our community's youth during the summer of 2022. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, all roll call votes for this meeting will begin with the Councillor of Ward 2. May I have a motion to accept the minutes? Yes, we're so going to do the July 19th minutes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So moved. Uh, Councillor Councilor Clement, seconded by uh, Councillor um, McCarthy. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2. Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. Ward six? Yes. One? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Yes. We now have our uh, public comment period uh, for this evening. Any member of the public may make comments regarding issues pertaining to Lewiston City Government. This period is reserved for non-agenda items. Public comment is also allowed during individual agenda items. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person. Please state your name for the record and please indicate if you are a Lewiston resident. Because this is the business meeting of the City Council, all questions should be directed to the Mayor who will ask staff to follow up at a future time. It is illegal for the City Council to allow comments related to personnel matters. All personnel complaints should be made directly to the City Administration Office. Yeah, oh yes, we're, please, please begin. Hello, uh, my name is Jenny Graves and I'd like to talk about the Cody Street Park that was presented earlier today. I'm a resident on Hilltop Ave. If you're not familiar, it's a beautiful dead end street off Webster Street. Um, two of the streets that are adjacent to the proposed park are dead end streets. I purchased my house on that street to raise my family for low traffic, safety concerns, things of that nature. I've never had a problem um, regarding safety while on that street. If you're not familiar with Ashmount Street, um, there is uh, public housing on the other side. And like I said, we've never had a problem, but there are concerns from me and my neighbors about people coming into the park um, that's proposed. Um, to go off of what Councillor LaChapelle said, regarding the funding, you know, I don't know why we keep taking funding for parks that we're struggling to staff the police department, public works to beautify the city, but yet we're gonna undertake a large park that has a direct impact to abutters and other people in the neighborhood. Um, we had a, a pretty intense neighborhood discussion with abutters such as myself in May um, with representatives from public works and Councillor Harriman. And the last that I had uh, my impression from that was that there was a strong opposition from the abutters regarding the park. Um, I've waited during the summer to see if there would be a follow-up meeting where we could have good discussion regarding the plan design and I was told to postpone to this evening to come to the park workshop. Well, there's not really a dialogue to discuss the park. It's kind of listen to where they're at, they present. And so my hope is that there can be a follow-up meeting with concerned citizens such as myself to address our concerns. Um, I feel like there's been a 
total lack of communication, which they have admitted. Um, I found out about the park because there was somebody surveying my backyard, and I, I'm lucky and I work from home. And I went out and talked to them and said, hey, what are you doing back here? And they told me that, oh, the city's looking at putting a park in. Um, news to me, I officially found out with the survey that came out in May um, because the city was behind with issuing letters to abutters to notify them of this park, um, which is quite substantial. And, you know, I, I, we did ask for, can we limit um, the footprint of the park? And it's my hope that the city is seriously looking at doing that if the park must go forward. Um, again, three minutes I don't think is probably enough time, but I can't be selfish. There's many in the room. And so my one hope is we can have a follow-up meeting with the abutters, with the local neighborhood uh, regarding the plan design. Thank you. see what they do with former police chiefs. They make them photographers. <laughs> uh, my name is Larry Gilbert. I live at 39 Cody Street in Lewiston. And uh, I, uh, I first want to say uh, I think Public Works does good work. Uh, I think their snow removal is second to none in the state. We are very fortunate to have an arborist, and uh, I think he does an outstanding job with what he has to work with in terms of uh, manpower and, and finances. And so, quite frankly, he's overwhelmed, uh, as is uh, the department. We cannot maintain what we already have and we're going to take on more and uh, there are some real concerns there to have a park in the woods like that because it could become a homeless encampment it could be a place for drug dealing and uh, it could be a public safety uh, issue for children in a playground in the woods. Uh, we have all kinds of stories throughout the United States about children being abducted, being assaulted, and so on. And so that is a real concern. Now, NIMBY, is it in my backyard? Of course it is. I abut, the, I abut that, that area. And uh, uh, I have uh, written to all of you, counselors and mayor, uh, and pointed out uh, different issues as to why we're not even keeping up with what we already have. I, we just got a basketball team at the Army. I went, I went to the basketball game and I looked at the front of the Army and that area, they call it the rain area or whatever, drainage was planted and forgotten completely. I mean, there are plants that are up as high as those, those lights there, never touched. And I brought it up to the mayor at, at one of the games. Okay, so you know what happened? They put, apparently put weed killer there because the weeds were huge and they cut some of the plants. Everything there is overgrown, should be gone, okay? and find out another way to do the drainage because you can't maintain it. Even a sidewalk was completely blocked, completely blocked. And all they did is they cut the plant so that the sidewalk would be clear. So, I, and then the, uh, the Bernard Lown Peace Bridge. Last year I talked to- uh, uh, We'll need to, uh, your, your three minutes are currently over and I'll need you okay. to wrap up. Very I was just quickly. told that uh, it was taken care of and it was taken care of because I brought it to the attention of the public works director, the Bernard Lown Peace Bridge, because it wasn't touched, it was abandoned. It was abandoned last year and, uh, and we had the event and it was minimal what was done and right now it hasn't been touched and that was August 6th, today is September 6th, still hasn't been touched since. 
Thank you. What you need is to fund, okay, what you're going to do and put the proper, hire the proper personnel to do it. Thank you. Further public comment? Hello. My name is Rick Grenier. I live at 35 Cody Street, and I apologize in advance because this is going to be all over the place. I'm really not a public speaker. Uh, regarding the Cody Street Park, uh, like my fellow neighbor, we're, we're in that area because it's fairly quiet during the day. At nighttime, we have the PVA element, which kind of turns it up a notch, uh, which is what we don't want to be happening into that park. You know, we feel that that element is going to move down in there and it's just another place to party. As she said at the other park, it's not that kind of park where you can pull up and have a party. Well, this is exactly what this is going to be. The, uh, the notifications that have been going out regarding what's happening, we, we found out about it like, holy cow, what's going on? You know, and then you start posting little QR codes on telephone poles. I don't, I believe that posting notices on telephone poles is, is a no-go. I'm not quite sure, city ordinances type stuff like that. But we're just worried about the problems that it's going to cause. And I'm not a gambler, but I will bet that something bad is going to happen in that park. Something really bad. We chase people off the street. I've been chasing people off Cody Street at 1130 at night. They park on Cody Street and they move on down the street to you know, a house in the neighborhood that there's maybe some questionable behavior going on. And I have to go out at 11.30, 12 o'clock at night and say, hey, move along. Uh, Officer Philippon was at that meeting, which I was not the first meeting in, uh, in May, which I wasn't able to attend. And he was stating that, you know, there's really not gonna be any problems, you know, and if there are, call the police department. Well, the police department, as you know, has some staffing shortages. And uh, I guess he did a little speech for, or a little article regarding somebody running for a DA, and he stated that, you know, we can't maintain our staffing in the police department. We have faulty equipment that needs to be taken care of. That money should be going towards that kind of stuff. And I just believe that we should not be taking on any extra projects if we can't take care of what we can't, you know, what we have right now. Thank you very much. Further public? Yeah. Uh, my name is Pauline Legassi, and I live on Cody Street also, 32 Cody Street. And um, our concerns are exactly what uh, Mr. Um, Gilbert and uh, what Rick just uh, said, so I'm kind of reiterating a lot of the concerns here. Uh, this is definitely going to increase uh, vehicles along or up and down Ashmont, Fairmont, Cody Street. Uh, I know there's going to be uh, areas where you can park your car in this park. It looked like there were nine, if I looked at that correctly, and one for a van or whatever. But if this place is packed with people, let's just say, uh, these, uh, they're going to start parking along the street. That's going to increase the traffic, the cars, and also pedestrians going up and down these streets. It's going to become a hangout for maybe homeless people. It's going to include a hangout for drugs. And it, my concern also is maintenance, your ground maintenance. Uh, again, we're short on help. Uh, police, uh, maintenance people, whatever. I don't believe this is uh, where our money should be going to another park. Uh, there, you know, uh, Mr. Gilbert said children, uh, drugs. I mean, I just, I mean, you know, needles on the ground. All these concerns are, you know, something that we believe uh, probably could happen. Uh, thank you. My name's Reggie Gassy. It's my wife. It's my mouthpiece. Uh, we've been on Cody Street since 1980. And 
it's been pleasant there. When the development was built, the cops were there 24-7, almost all the time. I said, that's, it's in my backyard. And there was always people after midnight just walking up and down our streets. If people don't see them, I do. I'm, I'm a light sleeper. Now I ain't. I mean, I got hearing aids. But anyways, there's always problems there. And the cops are always going there. You're talking about speeding up and down Cody, I mean, Ashmont and Fairmont. We hear it all the time. I mean, there's cars that are loud, the motorcycles go by Nikki's house, I mean, doing 80. I mean, come on, speed bumps? Speed bumps aren't going to do nothing. The kids from that development are out at, at midnight. If you got cars going up and down, because there's going to be problems with that park. There's going to be people doing drugs, doing whatever's in that park. We've got now a car that parks at the end of the street. And I've been watching them. And there's just guys coming down from the development with grocery bags. And I don't think it's groceries. And they get in the car and they pull down the street, they take off. So I don't know what's going on there, but it's, it's up to no good. And if you put a park Stuff is going to happen there because the kids are out at night doing whatever they do. I'm just saying there's going to be problems. So, a park is nice. You've got Genron owns all kinds of property all over the place. We used to have Paradise Park that's down on Alfred Plood Way, is it? Or used to be down there? I mean, they got property there. You can build a park down there. It's not in a neighborhood with residents all over the place. I mean, there is plenty of land around to build their so-called park. They don't have to build it right into a neighborhood because it's going to be problems, especially with the development up there. They already have problems up there. I mean, three, four, five times a week the cops are going up there. We hear sirens going up there all the time. So. It's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. You put a park there. I'm just saying. Okay, thank you. Further? Uh, okay. Fern Clucci, I live on East Cody Street. I've been there over 60 years. When I moved there, it was just a little tote road. And I'm, I appreciate the city for accepting the street and taking care of it. But it's only a one-lane street. I don't know if you've ever been on Co East Cody Street, but it's only a one-lane. And they tell me they want to make an entrance to the park on Cody Street. Well, I can't imagine seeing too many cars out there. If a car comes in and they're going out, you have to stop and park on the side of the street, let the car go by. So I don't think that'll be going to be any good. Now, if uh, they gave me an in entrance off Ashmount, people are going to walk down. You're going to have to have boardwalk because that's all water down there. It's all mud, and you're going to have to have boots to walk in there. So you're going to have to have boardwalk, and who's going to maintain that boardwalk? And and the cost of and I appreciate the councilman La Chapelle talk being concerned about the money and uh, so uh, and, and the animals in there what's going to happen to all the deers in there and if you think I'm kidding you go out there at night and you can see the deers out there and there's raccoons there's uh, skunk there's fox there's all kinds of animals in there and they're going to have to be gone so, and like uh, the, the previous man that talked before me, talked about uh, the property on uh, uh, Webster and, and uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> Alfred Woods Parkway, there's a nice big property over there that belongs to uh, the gendrons. Now, if anybody would approach the gendron and tell them what we would like to do with that property, 
and they were very generous people. And I'm telling you, if you would say, if you, we build a park there and we'll call it the Gentle, Gendron Park, they would be more than pleased to give us that land or loan it to us or do whatever. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Further public comment? Uh, I, is is there any uh, honorable mayor you've already spoken but is there anybody else who would uh, like to speak at this point all right uh, public comment is now closed thank you very much and uh, oh yes Councilor Clement Mr. Mayor I would ask your leave to seek unanimous consent to move agenda item number 19 to the head of our docket this evening as we have people that are here for that presentation Yes, yes, no, I, I think we're in uh, agreement with that, and I invite you to, uh, uh, to, to take it from here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number 19, which requires council approval, is a resolve supporting the candidacy of Gabrielle Barrett in her quest to become Miss Maine. The resolve reads as follows, whereas Lewiston native Gabrielle Barrett is currently representing Androscoggin County in the United States of America competition for the 2023 Miss Maine title, and whereas Miss Barrett has undertaken this journey to demonstrate being an overcomer and challenging herself beyond her comfort zone, and whereas Miss Barrett's competition platform is that of domestic violence, as she is a domestic violence survivor, and whereas in her quest for the Miss Maine title, she wants to share her story and be an encouraging support to others who have experienced any type of domestic violence. And whereas, in that regard, Ms. Barrett wants to volunteer, help with events, and participate in fundraising activities to assist with donations toward domestic violence education and prevention. And whereas, Ms. Barrett will be working with Safe Voices, the Domestic Violence Resource Center serving Androscoggin, Oxford, and Franklin counties, to assist individuals and their families toward a safe, enriched quality of life. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Lewiston that we support the candidacy of Gabriel Barrett in her quest to become Miss Maine and applaud her advocacy against domestic violence. At this time, I would ask the Council to vote on the resolve and, if approved, that we make a formal presentation, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Councillor LaChapelle and then uh, seconded by uh, Councillor uh, uh, McCarthy. And uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward uh, 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by a vote of 7 to 0. I would believe that to be unanimous consent. And with your leave, I would make a presentation. As I understand, Ms. Barrett and her parents are here this evening. Please do. <laughs> I would note at this point, didn't want to tint or taint anything, but her dad works for the city. He works in our public works department of water division. Oh, good. Excellent. Here we go. Stop getting resolved. I guess we're going to have a presentation. Congratulations and good luck. Uh, Madam Clerk, we will now return to the uh, consent agenda. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before I read the consent agenda, we'll just note for the record that uh, Councillor Gelinas of Ward 7 has an excused absence this evening. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda consists of four items. Item number one, order, authorizing execution of municipal quick claim deeds for real estate located at 11 Highland Avenue and 18 Belgard Avenue. Number two, order, authorizing the acceptance and appropriation of $70,000 from the FEMA Building Res Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant for the Jepson Brook Channel Upgrades. Three, order, authorizing the acceptance and appropriation of a $975 grant from the Endeavor Business Media for the Public Works Director to attend the 2022 Public Works Summit. And number four, amendment to the personnel policy to update the non-discrimination, sexual, and unlawful harassment section of the policy to include an anti-bullying policy. May I have a motion? 
Move for passage, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor uh, Councilor Clement, followed by Councillor Pease. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Uh, it's a consent agenda. Um, Madam Clerk, um, your thoughts? Uh, sure. Uh, right on the agenda, it's printed regarding the consent agenda that it is done in one uh, motion. And if anything is to be discussed, uh, Councillor would have to ask to have it removed from the agenda. Uh, Councillor um, Herman? Uh, on the consent agenda, it says unless a council member or a citizen so requests. Um, right, before the, before the motion is on the floor to be voted on. But really, it's really at the discretion, I guess, Mr. Mayor, of, of how you'd like to administer the meeting. Um, um, uh, Mr. Gilbert, what item are, uh, is in contention here? It's not in contention, it's in support. And it's item number three, order authorizing the acceptance of, and appropriation of $975 grant from the Endeavor Business Media for public works director to attend the 2022 public works summit. I fully support it and as I've written to all of you before that I support department heads to attend national conferences and to budget the same. They your, are invaluable. Your support is duly noted. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Madam Clerk, please proceed with the vote. Uh, Councilor from Ward 3. Yes. Word four? Yes. Word five? Yes. Word six? Yes. Word one? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Uh, item number five? Item number five. Public hearing on an application for a new liquor license and special amusement permit for live entertainment for Rusty Bus Brewing Company, LLC, 120 Lisbon Street. Requested action to authorize the city clerk's office to approve a new liquor license application and special amusement permit for Rusty Bus Brewing Company, LLC, 120 Lisbon Street. And at this, well, at this point, um, I, I think uh, for those of you that read the packet, I own this building, so I will turn this over to uh, Councilor Clement to uh, take over this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have a motion on this item. Councilor Pease, seconded by Councilor McCarthy. To the council for comment. Any comment, Councillor Scott? Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm very excited to see this come in. I know that as a part of a member of the Downtown Lewiston Association that helped promote this program to get this business in here, I'm excited to see it and I cannot wait for it to open. Thank you. Further comment from the council? To the public? Back to the council? Mm -hmm. Nothing appearing. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor is abstaining. Uh, motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Thank you, Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, agenda item number 6, Madam agenda Clerk. Agenda number 6, public hearing on a renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for Melissa's Pub 675 Main Street. Requested action to grant a special amusement permit for live entertainment to Melissa's Pub, 675 Main Street. May I have a motion? Second. C Councillor Pease, seconded by Councillor Harriman. Uh, discussion? Councillor Pease? The owner has been notified. I was wondering if the owner was here. Uh, they could be at the restaurant. I think they're open until 8. <laughs> Uh, further discussion from uh, the council? Public comment on this agenda item? Back to the council. Uh, Councillor uh, Scott. Thank you. Um, um, this is in my ward, and this is the replacement for Buddy T's restaurant at the Marketplace Mall. And I just want to say that since the replacement, this has done phenomenal business. The parking lot is full all the time, and I am super excited that they are doing so well in that new spot. And the, good. And and the food is delicious, yes. Further uh, comment from the council? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Item number 7. Item number 7, public hearing on a renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for Sonder and Dram, 12 Ash Street. 
requested action to grant a special amusement permit for a live entertainment to Sonder and Dram, 12 Ash Street. May I have a motion, please? So move for passage. Uh, Councillor Harriman, seconded by Councillor uh, Clement. Um, discussion? Public comment for this item? Back to the council. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Uh, agenda item number eight. Item number eight, public hearing on a renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for just-in-time recreation, 24 Mollison Way. Requested action to grant a special amusement permit for live entertainment to just-in-time recreation, 24 Mollison Way. May I have a motion, please? Uh, Councilor LaChapelle, seconded by Councilor Pease. Uh, discussion. Uh, Councilor Pease. Is this the uh, bowling alley? I Think yes, it is. So, and, and these are the new owners, correct? Yes, that, that's why. Um, yes, I'm just looking special amusement permit. Yes, I believe it is. Okay. Very good. I think they need all the help they can get in that area. They should. I hope they do well in this business. Mm -hmm. and I agree. I invite uh, Councillor Peace to uh, take me bowling. So. <laughs> uh, any further uh, discussion? Public comment on this agenda item? Uh, back to the Council. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 6 to 0. Uh, agenda item number nine, Madam item Clerk. Item number nine, public hearing for approval of an outdoor entertainment permit for the Dempsey Challenge. Requested action to consider a public hearing on an application from the Dempsey Challenge for outdoor musical concerts <coughs> to be held at Samard Payne Park on September 23rd through 25th as part of the Dempsey Challenge and to authorize a permit for an outdoor entertainment event as required by the City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 10, Article 1, Section 10-3, the organizing committee for the outdoor music concerts contingent upon positive recommendations from the police department fire department code land use officer and code health officer regarding compliance with all regulations and compliance with all city ordinances may i have a motion so please Councilor mccarthy second, second by Councilor harriman uh and i'll start things off uh, i met with uh the director and uh it's really exciting to have uh, the dempsey challenge uh, back in full this year, uh, I registered, um, and I'm looking forward to it. Further comment from the council? Madam, or <laughs> public comment for this agenda item? Back to the council. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7-0. Agenda item number number 10. Item number 10, public hearing and first and final passage for an extension of the moratorium ordinance regarding new homeless shelters. There are three items for requested action. The first item, that the proposed extension of, mor of moratorium ordinance regarding new homeless shelters be effective September 24th, 2022, receive first passage by a roll call vote. So May I have a motion? Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor McCarthy. Uh, discussion. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, so I think that everybody here is well aware of my opinion on putting a moratorium together. I do feel that we could have done this work outside of having a moratorium. And I had stated at our last meeting that I would be not be voting in favor of this. But I have thought further upon that. And I think that in light of the amount of work that has been done, the compromise that we've seen here, that I will be supporting my fellow city councilors and in voting so that we can get this work done and move forward with this. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One of the things that people need to realize is this, it says for another 180 days, but that is just a formality. Uh, the Council has agreed that as soon as this, the uh, city ordinance governing homelesses, homeless shelters uh, receives final passage in effect, then we will 
uh, lift the moratorium. So the 180 days, don't let that scare anybody. It's just to let us finish all of the hard work that we've put into this and come up with a comprehensive and common sense uh, ordinance to govern these shelters. And at that point in time, once it takes effect, then uh, we will lift the moratorium. It was just to, just a safety safety valve or whatever you want to call it to prevent uh, something happening between the, ex the ex expiration of the 180 day moratorium and the implementation, implementation of the ordinance. It would make no sense to leave a, a, a gap open like that. So it was just, a, just, um, just to make sure things go according to plan. So I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. Thank you. Um, Administrator Hunter, just a point of clarification here. Um, I understood the, uh, um, this extension to automatically lift once uh, an ordinance is a fact, or can you uh, speak on that? That's the way the ordinance is, read, or is drafted, is to automatically li lift. Once right, the, so the ordinance has passed, and then the 30 days has lapsed. When right, we will not. Effective. Yeah, we will not need to uh, meet again to lift an ordinance that to would lift be the moratorium. Correct. There would yes. be no further action. Okay, just for the public scarification, uh, Councillor Harriman. Thank you. Um, with respect to my fellow councillors, um, I still maintain that we didn't need a moratorium in the first place to do this work. Um, we we update ordinances frequently without creating a moratorium on a, an entire. Um, you know, an entire class of things. And I think some of the, the difficulty in crafting the language of the moratorium back in March may have spoken to the, to the fact that it wasn't really the right tool for the job. So um, I maintain that we, we never needed it in the first place and I will not vote to extend it. Further uh, comment from the council? Okay. Councilor Pease. Uh, in response to Councilor Herman's thing. Uh, I think it was necessary for us to do this. Uh, if we hadn't done this, the ad hoc committee probably would have never been developed. All this information and hard work they put into it probably never would have happened. Now we have a better view, we have a better understanding of what's going on, and now we can proceed in the proper way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, further comment uh, from the council before we go to public comment? Um, public comment on this agenda item? I'm getting older, so I like to sit. <laughs> By the way, this is the best looking city council decorations I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, I came here uh, to speak. Uh, in opposition to extending the moratorium. Uh, in my mind, I was seeing this as simply a delay tactic. And uh, there are real issues out there with homelessness and different circumstances for people to be homeless. Some of that can be drug addiction and some of that can be as a result of trauma, all kinds of things. Veterans are homeless. And um, the winter is coming on. I remember back when I was on the police department and I was a patrol officer, we used to have four, we used to call them the sterno boys because they would, uh, take sterno and, and put it in a sock and drain it and drink it because it was cheap. And then there was the Thunderbird wine that uh, they drank because that was cheap also. But they were homeless also. And they didn't have a place to sleep. And in the cold of winter, and I remember one night we had a person who uh, apparently was intoxicated and fell in a snowbank and died. And uh, so we used to have what they called uh, lock them up for safekeeping. They would come and report to the police department, which was down the hall here, and we had a cell block. And uh, they would, we would book them for safekeeping. They would stay overnight, 
and then in the morning we'd open, them up, open it up and let them go, but at least they were out of the elements. Then that became, uh, we couldn't do that anymore. So then, uh, by that time, I was uh, a superior officer and we used to let them sleep in the stairwell that let, led upstairs because just to be out of the elements for the night. And so right now we have people who are out in the elements. And uh, you have 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Oh, Gilbert. God, when did all of this happen? Anyway, because uh, let, let the public speak. This is about the public here. Uh, so anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, because I, you know, I don't want to go over the time, but uh, you know, people are going to suffer. They urinate in businesses down on Lisbon Street in the doorways. They defecate in the parking garages, and so on. So this is really happening, and it needs to be addressed. And you're the people who can do that. I urge you to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment on this uh, agenda item? Ron Potvin, 291 Pond Road, Vice President of the Store Next Door, the organization helping the homeless youth in the city. I rise tonight to oppose, speak in opposition to trying to extend this moratorium for three reasons. Three reasons that have been eloquently vocalized with this council in the past several months. We've had a report that said we have a serious need. A lot of work, as all of you have identified, that was put into this report. It's an immediate need. There was no, no ambiguity to it. It's an immediate need. You have all taken the lead to present an ordinance to move this forward so that different organizations can get involved and get this going. You have the power as a council to decide what's going to happen. What my fear is with the moratorium is it sends the wrong message. Now I understand there's an automatic clause in there that once the ordinance is passed that you know, then, then everything can move forward and the moratorium will be lifted. What happens if you run into issues with the ordinance? That's delayed. Then we have a 30 day on top of that. We have an immediate need right now that was identified. At the very least, we have an immediate need for a wellness center to take care of what's coming up this winter. The more delays, the more 30-day delay, more 30-day delay, more 30-day delay, we're getting into a position where we're unprepared. We have proven in this city what can work with a wellness center, not once but twice. Now, were there issues? Sure. But we've learned from that. We can move forward from that. Lastly, my biggest concern is the message it sends to the organizations that would be preparing to bring forward proposals for these very shelters we've talked to, we talked about youth, about family, and about the adults and their issues, whatever it be, mental health or substance abuse. And I think we need to open up the idea that we, where we need to move forward, we need to do this, we need to embrace who's out there with the proposals, with no delay. It is such an impending issue we can't ignore it any longer even if it's boy by 30 days here 30 days there 30 days there so i just implore the council to have further discussion that you know is it really necessary you guys have the control to to do whatever you need you know i just don't want further delays or send a wrong message to the people who can be productive in helping us with this issue thank you Further uh, public comment? And uh, back to the council. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I would just like to point out uh, remarks that have just been made. Uh, I think there may be a misunderstanding of what's happening here tonight. This council has labored over this issue. We have an ordinance coming up next on the agenda to be voted upon tonight, first passage. It requires two passages, as any ordinance does. The extension of this moratorium is not going to delay anything. If we vote on the ordinance tonight, it's still going to be another reading and then 30 days if approved before it becomes effective. The extension of this moratorium protects the city in the interim until that ordinance becomes effective. It is not intended for delay. We have applauded the good work of the ad hoc committee that put together this ordinance, and we intend to in, uh, act on it tonight. I think you may see some minor amendments to the ordinance because it's being seen for the first time in final form, but the intention is to move that ordinance forward. It's not delay, and I would dare say that if we don't extend this moratorium, you won't have the votes on this council to approve the ordinance. So bear with us through these next two items, and I think you'll see that what you brought up is being addressed and addressed properly. I thank you. Uh, further discussion from the council? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I get to, as was mentioned by Madam Clerk, I get to, to vote on this tonight in um, Councilor Gelinas's absence. And, um, and I really do appreciate how far the council has come over the last few weeks, for sure. I am, um, I think there's a lot more understood now than at the, than at the beginning. And, um, you know, uh, the ordinance that we have on the next um, agenda item, you know, is a, is a reflection of that. And I deeply appreciate the work that um, the committee has, has done. Um, I appreciate, um, thank you, uh, Craig, for everything you have done. And, and Amy, if you're watching, thank you. Um, but I, I do disagree with the notion that um, without the moratorium, we would have uh, not had the committee. We certainly could have had a committee without the moratorium. I do think the moratorium sends the, the wrong message. And, uh, and I understand um, where a majority of the council is on this, um, but I, I do not um, think that we need a moratorium. I don't think that we needed a moratorium and we don't need one now and I will be uh, voting no on this. Um, uh, without uh, further comment, I will call the roll. Yeah. Madam, Councillor McCarthy? Yes, Councillor from Ward, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, are you? Are you no, are you, no, 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 I'm getting ready to vote. You're getting ready to vote. Getting ready to vote. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's anticipating it. Thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Madam Clerk, I apologize. That's Please okay. call the vote. No problem. Thank you, sir. Councilor from Word 2. Yes. Word 3. No. Um, sorry, Word 4. Yes. Word 5. Yes. Word 6. Yes. Uh, word 1. Yes. And Mr. Mayor. No. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 2. Uh, the next item before you is uh, item number two, to waive section 7C of the rules governing the city council and to allow for a final reading at this time. We will um, stand at uh, recess for just a second. Sure. We'll, uh, yeah. With the council's uh, approval or mm -hmm. consent.
and uh, we're back. Um, Madam Clerk, were we calling a vote? Sure, yeah. Or yep. were we, or we were on agenda item number 10? Uh, yes, sir. So we're uh, part two of number 10, which is to waive section 7C of the rules governing the city council and to allow for final reading at this time. May I have a motion? So Move to pass. Uh, Councillor uh, LaChapelle, seconded by uh, Councillor Clement. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? No. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? I'm sorry, Ward 1? Yes. And uh, Mr. Mayor? No. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 2. The third item before you is that the proposed moratorium ordinance regarding new homeless shelters to be effective September 24th, 2022, receive final passage by a roll call vote. Move for passage. Uh, Councillor Clement, seconded by Councillor Pease. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? No. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? No. I mean, yes, sorry. I apologize. At Mr. Mayor? No. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 2. Uh, am I to understand that we're at uh, agenda item number 11, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Uh, excellent. Item number 11, public hearing and first passage to amend the business license ordinance to set forth purposes and standards for the issuances of local licenses for homeless shelters. Requested action that the proposed amendments to Chapter 22 Business Licenses, Article 16 Homeless Shelters of the City's Code of Ordinances receive first passage by a roll call vote and that the public hearing on said ordinance be continued to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. May I have a motion? Move for passage. Uh, Councillor um, Clement, seconded by Councillor Pease. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Clement. I'd like to take this opportunity and thank the shelter committee that put together the bulk of all this work along with city staff that's worked on it i think we have a very workable ordinance here something we didn't have before we were faced with a, a situation that required something of this nature in my estimation we have come up with it now i understand that some of my colleagues will have minor amendments to this ordinance tonight and i think we want to listen carefully as to what they might suggest as improvements on what's presented for us uh, in the in the ordinance itself. Thank you. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First off, I just wanted to point out um, page eight uh, under the exemption. Some of them are numbered wrong. Seven should be six. Eight should be seven. Eleven should be ten and 12 should be 11. Okay, and also um, in the paragraph above where it says set forth in section 10, it should be section nine, according to my esteemed colleague. The only other thing that I have to discussion on those is I would act, like to add section three to that exemption because section three says on-site supervision shall be required for a homeless shelter 24 seven and we're exempting them from having to be open 24 seven so it makes no sense that we require it to be staffed 24 seven so I think that should be added to the exemption um, uh, thank you uh, sorry thank you Councilor McCarthy uh, madam clerk um, would it be uh, appropriate to hear all the suggestion, suggestions, um, uh, deliberate here on the council, then head to public comment, then come back? Um, or do we need to tackle these one at a time as amendments? Uh, no, I think you can do them all as a group. It's sounding like they're all going to be somewhat similar is my guess. So, um, yes, some I think you them. could. I'm sorry? I believe some of them will be similar. Some of them will be similar. Okay. Um, uh, no, I think it, it's, I think it's wise to hear all the amendments and then you could go to public comment once, uh, but it might be a matter of needing to vote on some of those amendments In, individually. Independently, yes. If, if that makes sense, yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, great. Um, yes, uh, Councilor Harriman. Thank you. I just had a question as to whether this has been reviewed by the city attorney or not and if there were any comments or anything. Yes, he has reviewed it extensively with 
Director Hedegar um, going back and forth, working out the details and suggested language. Um, so he has, I think he reviewed not only the final, but the first three iterations as well. So yes. Thank you. Councillor LaChapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I'm looking under approval and operation requirements number five. I guess I'm just looking for clarification. Coordinated entry system. Um, is this requiring that they have on site case management service coordination and rehousing assistance? Is that a requirement for existing shelters? I just want clarification on that. Director Hedegar, if you could assist me with that. Yeah, I'll just let me check here to make sure I'm um, with you. Thank you. And the answer is yes, that would be a requirement for existing shelters. Okay. So then I would move that we add number five to the exemptions of existing shelters also. Um, so, um, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, just for clarification, both to both councilors' concerns, we are, these suggestions are being made to, for exemptions to existing shelters, correct? Correct. What we're correct. discussing? Okay. Existing correct. shelters only. And I still have a problem with the number 11 uh, beds. No more than two unrelated individuals are allowed per bedroom. Um, I think we're doing a disservice to the shelters to require that be the, the case. If somebody has... Uh, we, we talked about it, uh, my, my son going to college, there's four of them in a the room. Um, why, if, if it's the best practice that that shelter wants to do it that way, that's fine. I don't think we should require them to do it that way. If they want to have a large open room and have ten beds per the room, that's their prerogative. Um, I think that's just hamstringing them on, on that, on section... 11 I would eliminate 11 altogether for just the regular shelters so that's just to, to be clear so the second paragraph under the exemptions on, on page 8 um, where it was referenced there were some um, right. cross references that need to be correct corrected beds is referenced as not needing to be addressed right so by no later than January 28 facilities must bring their be brought into compliance with the remaining criteria except for hours Correct. of operation. Bed. I'm talking about the, a new shelter coming up. Okay. If anybody wants to open a new shelter, I, I understand what best practice is, but if they choose to open up, we just had the big article in the paper that it's in the basement of a church coming up and they're going to put a bunch of beds in there. Um, I don't want to hinder somebody else from having that ability to do it. I'm not disagreeing with that might be best practice, but Let's face it, I'd, I'd rather have eight sleeping in a room than uh, two in a room and six out in the snow. So I would recommend eliminating 11 altogether. Um, and now I'd like to jump to back to page one on the definitions, homeless children or youth means a person 21 years of age or younger who is, I would strike the 21 years of age and put 18. And the next paragraph altogether I would throw out, just put a big X through it, and the intent of the council, or at least us at the last meeting was at least the people that voted in favor I don't want to speak for the entire council those who voted in favor the intent of that was to have a family because we're, we're talking about a family is a parent or parents or legal guardian of a minor or, or of, a, of a child that would be the definition of the family, a parent or parents or legal guardian of the child. Not their aunt, their uncle, their niece, their nephew, their cousin, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, it doesn't matter. If, 
if that person is staying with the grandparents and the grandparents are the legal guardian of that child, then that's a different story. So they could not move into the, because we're trying to do unlimited, which is gonna move me into the next phase, unlimited shelters for families with children. So the, the intent of that is not to have mom with two kids and her brother and her grandparents all moving in at the same time. It is the parent or parents or legal guardian of a child 18 or younger. Now, is it possible, I'm asking the question, um, we're talking about wraparound services that I don't know where we put it, but I'd like to have some kind of language inserted that within two weeks of a child in one of these shelters, they must be enrolled in the public school system, in a school system. Because I truly believe that that is, the education is gonna be our best way to assist these people, to assist anybody, is through education. And if they choose not to enroll their children or child into the school system, they're, well, that's just part of the requirements. If they choose not to follow the requirements, then they don't have to stay there. So I, I'm, I'm asking for guidance on the, wor on the verbiage of that and how to put that in, similar to, uh, and maybe that's gonna be um, in that next section where they had, you know, no, no low barrier, low barrier shelters. I, d I don't know where to put that, Director. So I, I guess it's more of a question for you on that last one. A um, Couple thoughts, comments. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to answer all of the questions right now. With respect to the definition of homeless children or youth, um, that is worth checking again. 21 was recommended because I believe that is what um, Department of Education uses as a um, threshold for what a youth is. So if we're looking to do something less than that, then I believe that's gonna be a number that isn't recognized by Department of Education um, because the recommendation was, at the last meeting was I think 18 years old and upon doing some research, I, I think the state is looking at that as 21 age. So we can confirm that, but if there's a concern about school age children and whatnot or what youth are, I believe that number is 21. Um, with respect to the definition of homeless family, um, there was a recommendation by the shelter committee too after seeing this that the term guardian be included. So um, I think we're all on the same page there. Just as a reminder, this definition is short of the term homeless and the reference to it having one or more children of youth. This is a definition that currently exists in our ordinance pertaining to um, lodging houses and density as regulated by the fire department. So how many people can you have in a dwelling unit um, and what constitutes a family? It's certainly up to the council if they want to narrow that down as Councilor LaChapelle said for purposes of, of the shelter. Um, and that's a point I wanted to raise tonight the way this is drafted, I think is slightly different than um, what the council talked about at the last meeting. And I wanted to raise that because there was some question about, we were talking about youth, we were talking about ages, we were talking about does that include family or not? I think there was some consensus among the council that we need to do something for youth, but where does that go? And who are those youth currently living with? Um, Ask Craig if he could do a little research um, as to where these youth are coming from or where, what their homes consist of. And um, from the school department, the number that was provided was that there was 258 homeless youth in the system last year in the school system. 18% of them were unaccompanied, so it was 47. And then 82% of them were youth living with one or more adult family members. So 82% of them are with a family member. Is it a guardian, is it a grandmother? I, I you know, don't know beyond that, and, and to, to your concern, uh, Councilor LaChapelle, 
are they homeless with more than one family member? I'm not sure either. So one of the things, there's a couple of things I wanted to flag for you folks this evening at the appropriate time, but with respect to homeless family, to make it clear that the way it is drafted right now, it's exactly what you've suggested. It could be one youth and multiple family members that would be exempt from the bed requirement. If we don't wanna go there, if that's not the direction of the council, that's great, let me know. But that's how we've drafted at this time to somehow capture a youth because three quarters of these youth are not by themselves. They are with a family member. So how do we incorporate that into this? And maybe do we need to limit it further so it's not an entire family, but maybe a single family member? Well, if you put legal guardian, that covers anything. So it doesn't even have to be a family member if that person is a legal guardian of that youth. Um, they don't have to be blood relative. They could just been a really good friend of the family. Uh, so I think that covers any of that. Uh, if that's the intent, um, if, I, if I understand what you're suggesting, if it's mom and dad who, who are also homeless with a youth, are we not looking to include mom and dad? I, with I did say that. I okay. said parent or parents, okay. two parents, the child, or a guardian. legal guardian of that child. So I guess our intent is not to have the mom, dad, and little Bobby or little Susie move in, and then their Uncle Bill and their cousin Fred and their niece Nancy decides to come in and move it. That's not the point of that, because we're trying to address the homeless youth in our, pot, in, in our, in our city, and I think we're making a concerted effort to say unlimited on that, but it's restricting it to youth. So one or two parents, and you can't have five parents there, one or two, my second husband or my third husband, one or two, child or legal guardian. It's just so I can have, so hopefully we can have more space for the youth in the facility, not adults. There are other facilities that the adult can go to. That's the intent of it. Yeah. And I have no problem being more restrictive than the state or the federal. We have the authority as a municipality to make something more stringent. Um, I will need to think about where we would put some language, if that's the council's desire for the two weeks must be enrolled and within two weeks be enrolled in the school system, that's probably gonna need to be some type of um, not necessarily a review procedure, but something to their policies. Um, and we'll have to work on the language as to which section to put that in. Probably under approval and operation requirements. That, that sounds fine. Thank you, Director. Um, are there any other, I guess what I would like to do at this point, um, is to, uh, rather than, um, not rather than, but first before we uh, talk about these proposed changes and, and um, go back and forth, um, what are the other uh, proposed changes that councilors are looking for at this time? Um, Councilor Scott? Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm gonna start on page one and because I wrote this first, I'd like to discuss the enrolled um, in school proposal. Discuss the what, I'm sorry? Enrolled in school proposal and a change of uh, language if, in that. If, I'm, if I may, are there any other, um, any other proposed changes to the ordinance or, or have we gotten all of them out at this point? Hold on just a minute, please. Yes. And then um, since we have uh, Mr. Saramag here, I invite you to come to the front so that way we can get your, um, your take on uh, the proposed changes as we're talking here. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor McCarthy. Uh, I'm wondering if we should reach out to Mr. Hedegar and find out if there's anything else that he wanted to bring to our attention also from his perspective. Um, I, thank you, Councilor McCarthy. I, um, is there anything? Uh, that you'd like to, any changes that Director Hedegar would like to propose? Uh, 
Um, not, well, there are a number of things I think that you folks should just be aware of. It's, it sounds like you folks have spent some time with it, which is great. Um, but there are a number of things I wanted to bring to you, your attention, either in light of previous meetings or changes that were made as a result of the city attorney's review. Um, Perhaps I should have had you kick things off. I guess if you can now kick things off. That not, would be not a problem. Um, Homeless family was one area that we were going to talk about. We've already started talking about that. I don't think we're done there. So we'll, we'll, we, we will be coming back to that. Um, wanted to bring to your attention on page two, definition of controlling person. Um, this ties into the affidavit. It seemed like from very early on in the discussions with the council, there was concerns about doing backgrounds on um, who was going to be operating these facilities. So we've tried to come up with a more um, specific definition as to who the controlling person is. So that definition there is going to be um, who is involved with um, a background check that would be completed by the city clerk's office. On page three, um, number the second number two so um, the, the sentence that begins with an affidavit again that's the section just relating back to that definition of controlling persons um, so again just making it clear that that's who the um, background checks would be related to on page four under e review procedures number four towards the bottom of the page this is where the city clerk will review the application to, to determine if the number of beds will exceed the 120. So it, this is important to, for, I think, for discussion here. Um, will cause the total capacity for beds within all homeless shelters in the city, excluding homeless shelters that primarily serve homeless families, youth, or children, not to not exceed 120. So what I think is important to note there is that this could have a facility, and I don't know that this is how um, facilities would necessarily operate, and I think Craig might have some uh, insight into this, but if you had a facility that had one wing that was available to anybody, and then the other wing of this facility was open to homeless families, we would only be counting those beds that, in that one wing, right, that, that, that goes to everybody excluding those that are primarily homeless shelters for youth. So if it's, a, it's, a, if it's primarily, this is a youth facility, this is a family, then it's, then it's very clear, right? But if we could, this does not prohibit a shelter from serving both populations. I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's a common practice, but just wanna bring that to the council's attention. Pa page four, number four. On page five, number seven, applications for renewal of licenses shall be reviewed and may be approved or denied by the city clerk. So again, that was discussed that initial applications would come before you folks, renewals would go before the city clerk. Public notices would occur for new shelters. Notice to the abutters, notice of this meeting before the council. Renewals would not occur, because the thought being nothing's changed at that point. This, the establishment's already been there. It's been vetted by you folks. It's just a renewal at that point that's being handled in-house. Same page, and, uh, letter F, appeals. Um, there was talk about which appeals go to the Board of Appeals, which ones go to the council. Um, after discussing with the city attorney, if it's an appeal of a staff decision, the clerk's deem an application incomplete, that should be going to the Board of Appeals. That would be an administrative appeal. If you folks deny something for some reason, though, that would be going to Superior Court then at that point. So depending on where they are in the process, it's either going to be going to the Board of Appeals because they're challenging staff saying that it's an uh, incomplete application or they're challenging the renewal of that application. But if it's an initial application by you folks and it goes to you folks and somebody wants to challenge what the council's actions are, that would go to Superior Court. Those that appeals that do go to the Board of Appeals, anyone who wants to appeal in a Board of Appeals decision then goes to Superior Court. So ultimately they could all end up at Superior Court. Um, 
We've added some catch-all language on page six under H, the second paragraph that begins with any homeless shelter that violates any provision of this article, the terms of any license issued under this article, any other applicable city Lewiston ordinance or state law or has failed to correct the violation within a period prescribed by the relevant enforcement agency. We're not sure what these shelters are going to have for licenses. They could have a food license. They could have a, a fire code issue, a, a, a police code issue, something that we're not necessarily thinking of here that's driven by this ordinance. So we put some catch-all language in there that says, if you're in violation of anything, <laughs> it's a problem. You need to correct it. On page seven, under approval of operation, excuse me, approval and operation requirements, number two, hours of operation, we've added language in there about curfews may be applied for guests to return to the shelter. Again, we're not, it, we're just putting it in there to make it clear. If a shelter wants to have a curfew, let them have at it. It's supposed to be open 24 seven, but if they're telling everybody needs to be in by 10 and that's their policy, that's their policy. Page eight, number 12, staff certifications. So all of this language here, right, is under our approval and operation requirements. So this is something that they need to submit as part of their application to determine that they have policies in place or they're meeting certain provisions. Um, they need staff certifications. One of the questions that we came up with staff is, you know, what are we gonna be looking for certifications? So we just threw some examples in there in talking with some of the local organizations of what that training may consist of. Things like first aid, AD, Narcan, overdose prevention, harm reduction, de-escalation, just so there's something there. So they don't come back and say, I'm a certified building inspector. <laughs> no, that's not a qualification we're looking for at a shelter operation. Um, you folks have picked up on the, um, the, the typos there. The, the reason those typos came out um, in, in, in J and the exemptions there is we did add a number 15 there um, that talks about if there's any change to ownership, they need to be advising the city clerk or the city within 10 days of that ownership there. So we, sh we shuffled some of the numbers there, but I will make sure that those are accurate. Those were the big changes that... Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of little nuances in here that um, both staff and the city attorney picked on, but those are the ones I wanted to bring to attention given some of the past discussions. Madam Clerk, did you keep a, a, a list of uh, the proposed uh, changes? Uh, I reviewed the, I res made a list of the changes that the counselors commented on. I didn't make a list of the changes that Mr. Hedegar pointed out because those were just the changes from your right. last <laughs> workshop to discussion to today. It was in your book as of Friday. So, yes, we do. So, I guess the question would be, Mr. Mayor, how the group wants to proceed if the counselors are done offering suggested changes to the printed uh, ordinance, and you could go to the public for comment and input. And then, when the comment is done from the public, what we might want to do is come back and vote section by section. Um, right and just do sort of like a, a mini vote, if you will, section by section, we'll make any changes and votes on that. And then when we're all done voting section by section, then we'll take one final vote to encompass the entire ordinance. So I know that sounds a little time consuming, but that seems to be probably the clearest just so everyone's on board with what we're voting on. I'm always appreciative that you come to these meetings, Madam Clerk. Thank yes. you very much. At this point, could you uh, delineate the proposed changes because I would like uh, Mr. Sotomayor's feedback on them. Sure, I just I want to uh, just make sure that there aren't any other comments from councillors. I didn't or, need to make it sound like we're cutting them off. Or Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Scott, did thank you, you have something? Yes, I have several things. Thank you. So I guess there's, there's several things I want to go through here. I'm on the, in, so as far as the have to be enrolled in school, I think that we need to be careful about that language and that we may want to look at enrollment in an educational program because I don't want to overstep our bounds on putting that kind of language in an ordinance. I don't know, I'm a little bit, I think we need to look at that a little closer on that. I'm a little reluctant to saying that they, they need to be because there are many kids that are not traditionally in a regular school program. So there are other options out there. There's, there's online programming, there's all sorts of things that maybe they can be involved in. So I'd like to look at that language. Um, 
the next part when it, we talk on page one, homeless children or youth. Um, I remember the conversation that we had last week, but I also was thinking about what the state level is and what the Department of Education says, and I think it's important that we look at that. Just, I would like some clarification. If it is 21 on a state level, that is, I would be concerned about changing it until we know for sure what we have there for language on a state level. Um, the next section on homeless families. So my understanding in reading this, and I could be incorrect, is that we were saying that somebody that is, it is like Council Lesterpel said, a guardian. So I was thinking that it could be an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother or even myself as an example with my son Kevin, who's not legally adopted. He's lived, he lived with us from his junior high year all the way, you know what I mean, to college. If we became homeless, I would hope that he would be included in my family, that we would have those services available. And I also want to make sure that we do include siblings as well. So it's not just, you know what I mean, we're, we're including all the kids and all the family members. But I wouldn't disagree that I don't want a family that has, you know, the third cousin down the line from, yeah, let's, it, I wanted to focus on the families with youth in our community that are homeless and struggling and what we can do to help them. So I appreciate that. Um, and then going to page eight. So on number 11, the beds. So I too saw the article last week that came out for the new um, emergency shelter that was put in place. I believe it was in Waterville in the basement of a church. And that the, it was, I can't remember if it was Waterville or Augusta, the city council voted on it and approved that. And I would be concerned if we have somebody that comes forward right now and says, we, I'm going to open up the Universalist Church and where we want to make this available. I don't want to put any stipulations on that, that they have to have a room with two beds and a bathroom. I understand when we're using, um, you know, it's a HUD programming or a home program or any of that federal funding in, in respect to that specifics, um, main housing, all of that. But if somebody, like a Trinity, somebody wanted to open up something because we have an emergency this winter and they say, I have the room to put 25 beds in there. I kind of want that to be available so we can get 25 people off the streets this winter. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I don't want to limit anybody from having the ability to do that because as the situation moves forward here in the winter, we may have somebody that wants to do that and I want that to be available for them to do that. And even some of the new, the new housing programs too. I mean, if somebody is willing to come in here with the serious situation we have, I want them to be able to open up a shelter if they can do it. Um, in respect to the exemptions, I would agree. I'm glad that those, I also saw all the number changes. Um, so here's my thing with the exemptions. I do not want to hinder our existing shelters that already exist. The ones that are here and have been doing the work for many, many years. I understand that moving forward, we want to ensure that a shelter is ADA compliant, that they have some of these programs in effect. I don't disagree with any of that. But I don't want to see a Hope Haven have to close down because they can't afford to put an elevator in there or any, and I understand that that's not, that's some of the exception, exemptions. But this is just me saying that I agree with, we need to have these exemptions because I don't want to see what we have already and all the great work that's been done already. Those shelters have to close down because we've put now all these regulations on there. Um, and just to clarify, uh, if I may, uh, Councillor Scott, just to clarify, Director Hedegar, like uh, we will not, um, uh, we will not need to change the layouts of current uh, shelters or or make current shelters ADA compliant. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then going back to page seven, one of, uh, one of the things that you brought up, Director Hedegar, the hours of operations. If I remember correctly, the wellness shelter was 24 seven, but they also had curfews. So I'm comfortable with having that curfew if the shelter decides that that's what they want to do. I think that the wellness shelter at the Ramada found that that was helpful to have that curfew. Um, so I'm good with keeping that in there. Um, I 
believe that's it for now. Thank you. Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I might address a couple of concerns that Councillor Scott raised, I think if you change that wording to approved educational program, approves, in other words, the city would have to approve something other than a school, a formal school, or an approved educational program. Would that wordage cover? So, I don't know. I feel like that's oversight on the city council to be approving an education for somebody when we don't know. I'm not sure that we're all capable of doing that. And that's not offensive to anybody. I'm not trying to say that we're not, but I feel like we're overstepping our bounds if we start saying that approval of an educational program. I would like to encourage that anybody that was in a homeless shelter for family or youth, we are encouraging that educational process. We are encouraging them to be in an enrolled program. We are putting them in touch with resources if possible to reach out to the school department to do what we have some of our um, Zoom classes that are available for students that can't make it to a traditional school or some of the other programming we have available. I'm kind of reluctant to say it needs approval by us. I'm very leery about that particular piece when it comes to that education part. I'll nuance that a little bit and say approved by the superintendent of Lewis, Lewiston Public Schools. Let, let the people who approve those types of programs approve it. I mean, I, I understand Councillor LaChapelle's concern. I have that same concern. I think education should be an important component. You can't just come here and lay on the couch all day. No, I don't disagree with that. I, I actually uh, don't. Counselor, Excuse me. Counselor Scott, sorry. yeah, we'll, um, sorry, we'll let Counselor Clement finish with his comments. One other thing, uh, when it comes to the, the church in Augusta, uh, I believe it is the council up there is considering it. I don't know if they've approved it yet. But I think under page 2C, license requirement, if we had a weather emergency that... Uh, a local XYZ church or religious group or some other group decided, hey, we can uh, put up 20 people, the city could declare such an emergency and that would preclude the license. If I remember chapter 30 of the code, that, that gives us some pretty broad uh, wherewithal. So I think that would take care of your concern perhaps on okay. the licensure there for anyone that comes along. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if it pleases the council, if I can get the um, Madam Clerk to, to read the proposed changes and get feedback from uh, Mr. Sarameyer at this time. Sure. So uh, just to review, Councillor McCarthy noted the need to renumber uh, some of those references towards the end in, in J. It's more of a housekeeping internal, uh, but we'll renumber references accordingly. Councillor McCarthy also said on page... Seven, section I three, um, recommendation to remove uh, or to change the the language regarding the uh, staffing, the twenty four seven, to change that and add that into the exemption for existing uh, shelters section. Uh, and then Councillor La Chapelle also on page seven in I five to move that section regarding the coordinated entry system um, to the exemptions for the existing shelters. On page eight in I for 11 under beds to eliminate that altogether. And then on page one, uh, the definition of homeless child to change from 21 to 18, and also on page one to remove the definition of homeless family altogether. I'm happy for any corrections uh, from counselors uh, if that was incorrect. Did you uh, mention the school uh, requirement? And yes, and, and then, um, thank you, and then the um, school language that within two weeks of entry, a child must be enrolled in a school system, and then there was some discussion, school system versus educational program. Uh, Councilor LaChapelle, did you have something? Yes, Madam for Clerk. Clarification. Um, it, to remove that definition of homeless family, but to it. replace it yeah. with parent slash parents parent, slash parents. legal guardian yeah. yes. of a minor child. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Saddlemeyer, Your your thoughts. <clears throat> um, I will. Well, I'll, I'll preface my comments by saying. Uh, 
you know, I've been trying trying my best uh, throughout this process to represent what the what the shelter committee has decided and, and recommended. Um, so uh, sometimes I'm in an awkward spot with when, when new things are introduced and I haven't had a chance to, to run it by them. But um, I think that uh, with regards to the additional exemptions, um, you know, the, the shelter committee recommended um, what it recommended. And as I said, um, we, there was uh, some of the most debate and division on the committee on that particular item, particularly uh, specifically with regards to what uh, the council is, you know, some council members are just concerned with in terms of not wanting to uh, inhibit the ability of um, existing shelters to continue operating. Uh, at the same time, the I guess the 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 side that uh, won the the debate and the decision was arguing that um, it's good to have as much um, uh, un standardization or uniformity in in the licensing standards that are applied. And that the the five year period is giving them time to uh, ramp up to that, or you know, figure out how they're going to meet it, and and bring forward concerns that um, you know could lead to further amendments uh, if so desired. So to some extent, it's at least challenging them to say, is this doable? Um, on the um, Bed number, as far as striking that entirely, um, I, I don't. Th yeah, I, I understand that, and um, I don't think it is uh, of greatest concern to the committee to strike that re relative to other changes that can be made. That was also something that was discussed more. Um, I think we've explained why it's considered best practice. I think you, you see better recovery results um, when that is the case. The existing shelters are uh, exempt, exempted from the bed requirement. Um, if council chose to strike that, uh, I guess I have less concern about that. Um, uh, and sorry, I'm not going in order here, but... Um, with regards to the definition of homeless children or youth, uh, everything that I've seen is using tw 20 years, 21 years of age. Um, I, I understand why 18 feels like uh, an, an age that we gravitate towards with regards to, to school. But, um, but as far as the definition of homeless youth goes, 21 years of age or younger is uh, what I've been seeing in, you know, state THHS, uh, HUD, Maine Housing, you know, that, 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 that's the definition of youth. And I do think that it might be a problem for a shelter to uh, come up with a different cutoff and get the funding they need to operate a youth shelter if, if they were being held, if they were having to decline people who are considered youth under all of these other definitions. Um, so I, I would strongly recommend keeping that as is unless we can find uh, reasons justified by the existing regulations to point to for, for a reason to change that. But I would not recommend coming up with our own uh, age for homeless children or youth. Um, on homeless family, uh, I, th I think par parent or guardian um, accompanying a child or youth is generally the, the intent uh, of, of what we've been discussing. I, I generally agree with that. Um, David described how the definition ended up in front of you and it was, I believe, as he said, pulled from existing city language. Um, so I guess we should make sure, if that's getting changed tonight, that we have that that new language read read back to everyone specifically to make sure um, they're okay with it. But but I agree that 
the conversation that we had last time, that was the intent um, to, uh, to have youth um, who are homeless with their, uh, the adults responsible for them, parent or guardian. Um, then with the, on the piece about the education, and I was listening very closely and taking to heart everything that we discussed last time, and I thought what we said on, on that subject was that you would move forward with this ordinance as, as, as is, and that this piece about the condition for being, um, this condition for youth shelter serving youth and being involved in the school system or education or something to that effect, you wanted a recommendation from the shelter committee as to what that would be and that council would consider that as an amendment to the ordinance at a, at a later date. If I understood that you were going to be trying to add that language now, I definitely would have uh, worked on that and brought forward the, the suggestion from the committee. My intention was to um, talk with uh, you, the operator, operators of youth shelters to understand what main housing already requires and um, share that information and you know what you come up with could be something to the effect of you know if you're if you're monitored by main housing then like meet that standard and then if you're not that then maybe that's where we're coming up with with a, a local standard um, but my expectation my memory my expectation was that that was going to be considered and debated later after we brought forward uh, some suggestions for, for you to consider so I would advise against not trying to come up with something tonight for that. Um, I think those are my primary comments. If I, if I skipped something, it's because it wasn't of, I don't, think it, I don't think I had much to add, and I don't want to belabor things. Um, anything else to add, Director Hedegger, at this time? Not this time. Okay. Further comments uh, from the council before we go to uh, Councillor Peace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't know if there's some language we can put in or how we can govern it, but there are homeless people that are living in shelters that are working. And if they work past a certain hour, they can't get back in there. They're out on the street, regardless, until morning. Is there any way we can make it an exception that if they have a full-time job and they can certify they have a job, they can come in. They, they're allowed to have you know, access. I'm so the, the way it's drafted right now, that's at the discretion of the shelter. Um, they're, they're, the intent is for them to be open 24-7 so people have a place to, to be and stay. Um, with the language of the curfew that we referenced, that's optional. That's if somebody wants to, you know, have some restrictions in place so folks do return at a certain time. Um, I guess the council could add language in there that says that, you know, there can't be curfews, um, that, you know, there has to be available maybe to address your concern where somebody is working a, a second shift and needs to come back at a later hour. Um, that's something we could consider. Thank you. I just think we need to put something in there because there are people in there that they can't afford to live in a regular place. They're living in a shelter, but they have a job. And they can't get back in once they go. Thank you. Um, okay, further, further comments from the council before we go to public comment? Okay, we are now going to public comment for this agenda item. You'll have to use the podium. The chairs are taken up here. <laughs> Hello, uh, Josh Renagy in Ward 1. I uh, just want to say, first of all, thank you all so very much for working on this. Um, to the curfew point, um, it is true that we have a lot of jobs in our community that are available to people with um, uh, low sets of skills um, that work second and third shift labor jobs. 
Um, so that might be something to think about as well as a bereavement, right? Somebody has to leave the shelter for a period of time, something that's verifiable, uh, that requires that they be away from the shelter, um, wouldn't re remove their uh, ability to, to attend the shelter. Um, concerning school enrollment, one of the things I'd like to point out is some of these uh, youth may not have documentation originally. Um, there's a process in which you get enrolled in school, um, and, and, and sometimes that gap can be, depending on where you're, you know, like let's say you're getting a birth certificate from Missouri and it has to come like certified mail. You know, there, 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 there are processes there that can slow it down. But I would suggest that these folks are attempting uh, to get into school as opposed to actually being in a verified, like it has to be in, in a way that if they're honestly trying, we should be removing the barrier. Um, then the, uh, the question with relationships, um, sometimes it's not an actual doc documented guardian, right? So if you have like a older brother, younger, younger brother, right? The brother's 22 years old, um, family members, older family members are out of the picture. Um, they're both homeless. What happens in that situation? It's just something to think about. Um, and then concerning the shelter beds um, and, and, and the relationship between the people in the shelter beds, um, will any of these ordinances uh, create a situation where we cannot have an emergency shelter? Like, emergency shelter would be defined by the council, correct? Okay, so then there, there's no issue there. But those are just my, my points to bring up because I think they're all, all worth considering. Thanks. I have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, to Councillor Scott, uh, the existing shelters, uh, is there a way that you could grandfather them so that they don't have to meet the elevator type thing or whatever? Could they be grandfathered? Okay. It's already there. It's already there? Yeah. Good. And the, uh, I guess I have a question for Councillor LaChapelle. What do you mean by legal guardian? What, what is a legal guardian? Is there something that shows that? Uh, we're, we're, I'll let you finish with your public comment and then, uh, and then we'll respond when we, when we come back. Oh, okay. Sure, thank you. Further. So I'm Alex Diamond Stanek. I'm a resident of Ward 2 in Lewiston. Um, just a couple quick thoughts about the amendment back and forth. I mean, I think the question of how we define a family is an interesting one. You know, the question of whether it needs to be a traditional family, right? If you're in a homeless situation, oftentimes there's a disconnect between the parents and the children. And I know that in my own situation, working, having childcare provided by someone who can come to my, where I'm living, right, who's not in that definition of sort of two parents, people outside that list are important for me for being able to go to work, for being able to be here um, in the first place. And these statements about, you know, we want, they're, if they're, they can open a shelter, we want them to be able to do it, right? If there's a weather emergency, we want to be able to allow that. I think the question is like, when do we define that there's an emergency in terms of homelessness? And so that piece connected to the larger um, limit on the number of beds is the main point that I was going to try to sort of talk about in, in pre-prepared comments. I'll see if I can do it in two minutes. That... Again, if I were in your seat, I would probably be voting for this in whatever amended version comes forward. Um, but I think it's important just to make this point clear, just from a quantitative perspective, that we are doing something that we think is actually less than the need that exists right now for residents of Lewiston. So commend you know, the, the shelter committee for their work, their report, having read it, you know, looking through the information that they have you know, that there are a thousand Lewiston residents who have experienced homelessness in the last 12 months, 258 Lewiston students, as we've already heard. And there was this point in time count, you know, that initially led to 270 beds, but then it was Androscoggin County versus Lewiston, maybe goes down by a factor of two to like 135, 134. 
But there's also the statement in the report that professionals widely believe that the point in time count is fundamentally flawed and that true numbers are sort of five to ten times higher than reported by that count. And so that, you know, it could be that we need a thousand beds, right? So I was going to tell a story about Geiger Elementary School where my kids, you know, made a little jar of M&Ms and tried to get people to estimate them. Right? And my kid counted every single one. We can't count every single homeless person, but we could say, okay, here's a lower limit, here's an upper limit. And right now, from my reading, we have gone to this conservative lower limit, meaning that if you were to make a bet I would, and you wanted to win the prize, I'm pretty sure everyone would say, yeah, we think we probably actually need more than 120. Right? That, that's the lower limit, and we're using that to set this maximum. Right? And I think that sets us up for situations about emergencies much more quickly, right? It's not like the city is providing these services. We are putting limitations on other people who might want to step in. So I guess I, I liked what I heard about we want people to be able to open shelters. I just think about the bed limit. We already know that conservative limit is a lower limit, right? We think the number is higher. Thank you. Ron Potvin, 291 Pond Road, store next door. I just want to mention, as I'm, I'm listening to the debate and the amendments, um, from, from my perspective, I'm not seeing any red flags, really. I think this is what you guys need to work through. Um, I respect what the city wants to do and how it wants to do it. And I think that... Uh, you know, you're all going in the right direction, and I just wanted to thank all of you for for the work that's come forward so far. Um, we've come a long way in six months, and, you know, it shows. And I appreciate the emphasis on the youth. I appreciate the emphasis on the families. And we'll eventually get there for the adults. And I, any of this that you're speaking, you know, I can see this working. And I wish you uh, the best in hammering it out. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to just thank you, you know, for moving this forward. And I'm hopeful that it's as expedient as possible and we can get things going. Thank you. Further public comment? Uh, back to the council. So my... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I thank you, Craig, for uh, Mr. Sandmeyer. Thank you for uh, providing your feedback. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, I am concerned about um, you know kinds of enforcing a, a school provision. You know, what if there's a reason why they're not in school? Um, you know, um, yeah. So I'm just concerned about the the, the difficulties in you know navigating that. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, Councilor La Chapelle, I do, uh, agree that perhaps a, a bed limit, um, could be, uh, could be removed. Further comments from Council Harriman? Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with, uh, my first is question for city staff. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of changes being considered here. At what point does this need to be re-advertised and rechecked by the city attorney and, uh, um, it's just a lot of changes that didn't come up during the workshop. I think it depends on what the final amendments look like. We haven't voted on those yet. Um, the only piece that we can um, let the uh, city attorney weigh in on, I think, would be potentially the definition and then the beds would be the most extreme looking at the ch changes but even then um, i think we're being more advantageous to potential shelters versus less advantageous so i i truly think that so far it looks like we don't have anything that will reset the clock into doing a first reading again okay thank you and i've got some um, also some comments on the proposed agenda, uh, amendments. Um, starting off with the, the age of youth, um, I agree that, you know, if 21 is the, is the 
commonly accepted age in educational settings, that that makes sense. Um, I would also point out that there are kids who are still in school past the age of 18, so um, we can't really we can't really just kick them out. Uh, they're they're still in school, really. Um, another issue is with the with the um, the guardians. I think, like Councillor Scott mentioned, um, she may not be a legal guardian of her son, but uh, I think that we can't we can't force shelters to make that distinction. Not everybody has that legal paperwork. Um, like somebody mentioned, sometimes older siblings take care of of kids. Um, sometimes other relatives, and they don't they don't have the resources uh, or the time to go through the legal process to do that. Uh, I'm also concerned about kids who live with their parent or parents and another relative. Um, say it's a kid and his mom and then his grandmother, and if they become homeless, um, the kid and the mom could go to the shelter under what's proposed here, but then the grandmother wouldn't wouldn't be allowed. Um, and I don't think it's I just don't think it's right to split the families up like that. Um, I also I met a Regarding the education piece, um, I met a gentleman the other day who moved here from out of state, um, had to move here pretty quickly, and left a lot of things behind, left basically all their belongings behind, and he has a son who I believe was 19, still in high school. Um, he couldn't get him registered in school because he doesn't have any ID showing who he is, and then he <coughs> can't get ID from the state of Maine because he doesn't have, he's not on the lease, he doesn't have any, um, you know, utility bills or legal things coming to the house in his name. So he, he's stuck not going to school right now until they figure out this administrative stuff. Um, so I, I just think some of these, these changes just make it really, really restrictive on who can be served and I think it, it risks splitting up families and excluding a lot of kids and, and other people who who really should be allowed shelter if they need it. Thank you. Councillor LaChapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess that it's in the spirit of cooperation. We're, we're trying to make an a honest attempt to address some of the issues. Um, the gentleman, I just forgot his name, just uh, the 250 students. Um, I, I want to have as many open spots for children in the shelter, not for grandma. Grandma or grandpa can go to the other shelter. I want to make it available for the youth and keep it a nice and as, as safe as possible. Um, I envision why I say 18, I'm looking at a 19 year old that goes to the youth shelter and doesn't want to work, doesn't want to go to school, and he can just sit there for the next two years. And no, that's not the point of having an unlim unlimited amount of uh, shelters for youth. It's, it's to help that person get educated. Now, I might not be using the correct verbiage. I have no problem with that. I have no problem putting this off for another meeting, but make sure it is on the agenda for us to address it. I do not want to miss it. I'm, I'm just a firm advocate on education is the only way out of poverty for a lot of people. Education. And sooner or later, the city of Lewiston, one way or the other, are going to pay for the people in the shelter, or whether it's through our services or whatever. The city of Lewiston will absorb some of the costs of this. And if it's our taxpayers' money, I, I do not feel that they should be enjoying the luxuries of sitting in a shelter and not doing anything. There should be some requirements for the said individual and for us to assist them to moving forward. When we're seeing the wraparound shelter, and that's a stipulation, if it's in the wraparound part and if the wraparound people are actively pursuing trying to get the, the proper paperwork, no, we're not dumping them in two weeks, you know, there, there are some problems. I have no problem putting that off a little bit um, and moving forward. I do have a problem with saying uh, 21, we can make it str more stringent. 
there's nothing that says we can't make it more stringent. Um, and go eight, I, I just have a problem with saying 19 years old, I'm sitting in the shelter, I don't want to work, I don't want to go to school, I'm just enjoying this right here. No, that's not what the point or the intent of us, and now I'm picturing a, a child in the sixth grade and with their mom and dad and having that ability, uh, not having that space because this eight, 19 year old is just sitting on their duff in the, in the, in the shelter. Uh, and as far as uh, emergency shelters, that's, I, I emergency shelters are like a, a fire or a flood or just a, a, a mass problem and emergency shelters throw all that out the window and you can open it at any time. Um, in addressing the, the, the bed count, um, I guess somebody reiterated it early, I'm just gonna review my stance. If we use the shelter committee's numbers from the very first meeting, we have enough beds in the city of Lewiston, by their numbers, we have enough beds in the city of Lewiston already at 88. Um, the revised numbers that they came back on the second meeting shows that we don't. I just um, don't know how they got the, the numbers messed up or maybe I wasn't clear on it, but it looked like the, the first meeting was 88 beds using their formula. Was there enough? The second. Um, so to say that we need more, sh more beds, well, we're going up to 120 beds. We're at 88, that's not a rule, but we're capping at 120 with an unlimited amount of families. So trying to address the needs of the school system, unlimited families. I think we have to keep that definition of families in there or I will vote against this and vote to remove this and just put a, go back to the original 134 beds and just kill it all together. That's my feelings. Uh, further comments from the council? Uh, Councilor Scott. Thank you. Um, so in the spirit of compromise, I don't disagree with that. I would like to get a little bit more confirmation on the school subject. I'd like to hear from the superintendent. I'd like to hear from New Beginnings. I don't know specifically what their protocol is. I'm pretty positive they have something in place where their students have to achieve some goals and they have to work towards an educational program. I'm almost 100% positive on that, but I can't speak to it for sure because I don't have it right here in front of me to say. So. I'm wondering on that particular piece if there's a way that we can add to the ordinance later on, and I guess this would be a question for you, once we found more information and the ad hoc committee continued doing that work in looking for that information, would that be a problem in adding some more language in there to the ordinance or would that cause a whole new issue? To that question, we can certainly, uh, there could certainly be changes at the next reading, correct? Right, as long as they're not material in nature. Right. So it depends on what they bring back if that becomes material in nature. So Mr. Mayor, may I ask if the committee feels that that would be enough time before the next meeting? That's the 20th, correct? Correct. Two, yeah. two weeks. To restate my understanding, I thought it was going to be after we passed the ordinance. That, that's been the timeline I've been working on. I, that's what I thought that, too. That, that's, to what, that's what I've been working on. That's what I would prefer to do. I, I would have, that's what I prefer to do. I'll leave it at that, yeah. Any further thoughts, Councillor Scott? Well, yes, because I really do want to keep this language in there about the, I think we came to a really good compromise. I think we are all looking at our families and our youth here and really trying to figure out how we're going to address that situation. And I really appreciate that. And I don't want to bring us back to step one because of some of the stuff here. I, I really want to find a way that we can work this out so that we can make sure that we're all comfortable with what we're putting forward, all of us. Um, that being said, I, I, I'm wondering if, council, if the 
the rest of the council would be willing to wait for that particular piece. I mean, I, I think that that's an important piece. If that's going to be something that's going to stick and not be able to be approved tonight and we're going to step back, I would have some concerns with that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, further thoughts from the council? Councillor Clement? I would think that if we're going to go along with Mr. Saddlemeyer's suggestion, that's going to require that we either not pass this ordinance or we pass the ordinance, then we're going to have to start with an amendment to the ordinance, going to have to publish an amendment to the ordinance, we'll have to have a first reading, a second reading, and another 30-day enactment period. If they could bring this information back to us two weeks from tonight, uh, I think it's very simple. We need to know the age and are there programs, new beginnings, the superintendent. I would think a couple telephone calls would answer those questions and we can move this thing along. I'm beginning to think that I'm not going to agree with, uh, with going ahead any further than I think we're here tonight. Let's act. That's what I'm thinking. And I, I just, I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing a lot of the cooperative spirit in the last few minutes, so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor LaChapelle, did you have something to add at this point? Yes, just a question, Mr. Sotomayor. What do you think your time, how much time do you think you need for your committee to review what our intent is to draft some kind of language? Um, I would, be more comfortable with 30 days so that the committee could actually meet to talk about it. But I'm not trying, I mean. So if I, we. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. understanding 30 days. Thank you for the answer. I'm gonna come back to the council for a second. Um, feel so strongly about this part that I wanna address the youth and, and move it forward we can put this whole thing off for another 30 days and just take the first reading in 30 days, get the language and adopt it and get the first reading in 30 days. Um, I, I'm just very concerned and I, so yes, I have no problem with letting him, letting him, excuse me, not him, uh, letting the, the ad hoc committee review it. Um, I propose then if, if they, really feel that 30 days is necessary that's two more you know, we're two weeks out to draft something to review it um, then we could just table this for another 30 days and come back in 30 days that's just a thought I'm opening up for discussion thank you uh, councillor uh, councillor Scott or, uh, I apologize councillor thank you um, so it sounds like if the sticking point is the Councillors, thank you. Thank you. It sounds like if the sticking point is the is the education piece, I was under the impression I, I was under the same impression as Mr. Saddlemeyer that um, that would come after the ordinance, um, that there'd be a, another ask for that. Um, you know, so what I'm hearing here, it sounds like we could just forego the the education requirement component pass the ordinance and then get a recommendation on that and and amend it at a later time that's what that's what i thought but maybe i'm misunderstanding things um uh, councilor clement did you have something to add just uh, a question i guess for the the council. The sticking point here seems to be the age and the education, educational program or whatever. I would think staff with a couple of phone calls could answer those questions, have the questions answered for us at our next meeting and we could move this thing forward in that regard. I don't see a need to table for 30 days. I'm not in favor of tabling for 30 days. We have dragged this out. We've come to what I think is the cusp of the hill, I've used that expression before, we just need to push it over the top. 
And I don't think waiting 30 days is going to solve anything. It's going to help anything. Quite frankly, I don't think the committee needs to ring in on that. I think that's a question that staff can answer. Uh, the council is going to be the ones to approve this ordinance. Nobody else gets to approve the ordinance. So therefore, we can direct staff to find an answer to those two questions, and I think that will resolve the issues that everybody has. Am I right in that? Can I, can I ask my fellow counselors that? If we get answers to those questions that are satisfactory, that's going to move this issue ahead? Uh, if, um, uh, sorry, are you finished, Councilor? I Come am on. now, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, um, with regards to the education piece, are we, are, are we going to, you know, for instance, if uh, we check in with, like, New Beginnings, are we going to be okay with how they handle it, or will we require uh, further, uh, further discussion at that point? Um, I would guess I mean, the council, whatever the council will indicates they're comfortable with, if the council indicates they're comfortable with the superintendent approving something for these people who, I, I just, I see what Councilor LaChapelle is bringing up. Between ages of 18 and 21, uh, you know, somebody says, I, I don't have to go to school, I'm not going to go to school. Uh, I don't know what age is required in Maine. I've worked in two states with the law, so I, I get confused at times. But uh, I'm sure there is an age in New Maine where you have to attend school. I don't know what age that expires at. Generally, the age of emancipation is 18. If these various agencies like HUD and some of these other bureaucratic organizations out there take it upon themselves to promulgate regulations that change what the law is, then that's what it is. But if our concern is uh, homeless children receiving some type of an educational benefit uh, while they're under our purview or under a city license, then I think if the city, namely the public schools uh, or somebody that they contract with says, yeah, this is acceptable, then fine. I'm fine with that. And I would think that everybody here on the dais would be. And then it's just a question of age, and I don't have a problem with amending it upward to 21 if that is generally accepted, but it's going to have to be a situation where they're still eligible. I mean, if they're a high school graduate, uh, they're not going to college, they're not, you know, I, what, what do we do then? I think staff can answer those questions, and I'm all for that. Otherwise, I, I may have to abstain or vote no on the ordinance tonight. Anything further, Councilor Clement? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Hedegar, would you like to, uh, to weigh in on that? Uh, to Council Clement's point, I, I do think that we can get some guidance here um, between talking with probably the school department, new beginnings, the city attorney, come up with some language that um, you folks can consider at the next council meeting. Um, it's to city administrator's point, We'll know at that point <laughs> if it's a substantive change of some kind that requires a uh, repeat of the second reading. Excuse me, a repeat of the first reading. Um, until we do that, I don't know. But I think we can get that guidance from talking to the school department and uh, you know, New Beginnings, other resources out there. So if I'm under... Um uh, if I'm understanding things correctly, uh, you know, um, requiring children to be in school is a, a sticking point at this point, uh, and we're going to be looking for for further feedback, um, you know, as directed by uh, Director Heidegger. Is, so, would it even be appropriate to vote on amendments this evening, or how should we uh, proceed if we're waiting on on feedback from from New Beginnings, the school department? You know whether we accept uh, Mr. Uh, Sarah Meyer's, um, uh, you know, recommendation that that 21 is the generally accepted age. Uh, yeah, uh, thoughts, Administrator Hunter. Um, if you don't vote tonight on something, the first reading gets continued to the next meeting. I see. Yes. Thank you. The other, not to wrinkle the discussion a little bit. Would, but listening to some of the commentary, 
within a reasonable time period, not to exceed 30 days to allow for the documentation. Um, the youth must be enrolled in an educational program or gainfully employed. You're saying that is uh, proposed language? That could address some of the concerns raised. Right. Uh, Councilor McCarthy, did you have something to add? She beat me to the punch. But yes, what I was going to say is that they should be pursuing uh, educa educational opportunities, uh, working towards a, either a GED or a high school diploma. But I think the succinct definition that the administrator has put out is probably better worded. Uh, Councilor Scott. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you, because I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I'd also like to see if we can get some of those things answered so that we can vote on this tonight. I want to get through this as well. I want to get this done so that we can move forward as quickly as possible. If we can maybe get an answer from the superintendent, I do believe it is 21, that a kid can still go to school in the Lewiston school systems till the age of 21. There is programming available for that but I can't again say that for sure. If we can get that answer and an answer from New Beginnings and then have that discussion on the 20th, I'm good to move forward with the rest. Uh, Councilor Harriman. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that suggestion, Administrator. Um, my only concern is that 30 days, if, it, if it's a hard cutoff at 30 days, that is probably too short for some people. Um, I don't, this person that I spoke to the other day who I mentioned um, with the son in high school, uh, I don't know every detail of his situation, but it sounded like it had been significantly longer than that, and they still hadn't sorted out all the, all the red tape. Um, so I would just be hesitant about that short cutoff. Uh, Councilor LaChapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, too... I, I like the administrator's suggestion. I would eliminate the gainfully employed part at the end because if they're 18, 19 years old and they're gain, gainfully employed and they're, and they're considered the youth, they should be into the regular shelter, not into the. I would agree. Not into the child, into the, to the youth shelter. There, that should be if that person's by themselves at 19 years old, go to the other shelter. Uh, if you're still in school. Uh, 30 days fine and folks there's a there's a limit there is some personal responsibility here that uh, that has to be accounted for so I, I would agree with what you're saying just eliminate the uh, gainfully employed part 30 days that's fine and that's just something for us to work on for tonight get it voted on get it passed on tonight I'll even leave it at 21 as long as they're doing something for the school if they're still in school, that's fine. If they're 19 years old and want to sit around a shelter and go out and do something during the day and come back, no, that's not the point. The point is there to help the youth of the community for the unlimited part. If they want to sit in a regular shelter and do whatever they want in a shelter, that's not my concern on that. That's going to be whatever the rules are falls under under the shelter part, but at least for the youth side. So yes, I would, I would agree, leave it at 21 as long as there's some kind of an educational piece tied into that. I'm fine with it. I know my grandson's gonna graduate from high school at 19, mm -hmm. the, way it, the way it falls. So I, I, I'm fine with that. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Clement. Mr. Mayor, uh, I concur with what the administrator said. Um, I also concur with the addition of that uh, phrased by Councilor LaChapelle, if they are gainfully employed and they're an adult beyond the age of emancipation, they belong in an adult shelter. I think, and I would urge my colleagues here tonight, let's vote on something. We have in two weeks the opportunity to do a final amendment. If we do nothing tonight, then we've set everything back to square one, and it, it just is not going to set well with me if we have to do that. I think we've come a long ways. We've had a lot of cooperative effort amongst people of the year. I can remember when this started, discussions that we had, no way this is gonna happen. We've come a long way since then. Uh, 
Exactly. I mean, we we said in the beginning that uh, we wanted this sort of thing, uh, and I, I just don't see any reason for delaying it any further. I think the suggestion by the administrator and the fact that Director Hediger or somebody on staff gets answers to those questions. We vote first reading tonight. If we approve it first reading tonight, two weeks from now we can make final amendments and then have second reading and passage as amended. Uh, all within the rules, unless city attorney were to say uh, that's a major change that you can't do. And I can't see anything in there that would be considered major. Not a thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, do you mind reading that back, uh, Administrator Hunter? Um, giving um, uh, you 30 days they, where they must enroll in an educational program, and it looks like the scratching of the gainfully employment. So it's the 30 days in an educational program that allows for flexibility. Uh, thank you. Um, Councilor LaChapelle, would, uh, would you be, um, would, the count, would you and the rest of the council be okay with a longer uh, frame, like 60 or 90 days? I, I do agree with Councilor Harriman that 30 days is a little too short. Well, it, it, it is short, but yet you're loosening up the definition on edu educational program. So you, you're loosening it up now. If all of a sudden I'm I'm online with the what's that university that you can go online on the, the uh, on the computer? Uh, so somebody there are can, many. <laughs> there's a bunch of them. So you're you're lessening the definition of education. I wanted in the school system. Now we have an educational program. So at least they're doing something. So no, I would say 30 days is is more than enough to get into some kind of an educational program. It's not saying you have to be enrolled into the Lewiston school system. You could be um, uh, online at the library every other day just into this high school program or the elementary programs. There are programs on the computer that you can work on. So no, I, I, I 30 days is, is fine with me. Thank you. Suggestion, Mr. Murray. Okay. Uh, Councilor Clement, did you have something to add? Can we add? Uh, perhaps one word that would take all of this into consideration, the word being application. Shall within 30 days make application for a program. That gives them, if they've got extraordinary circumstances, like the gentleman that uh, my colleague from Ward 3 brought up, uh, he's got a problem with out-of-state, uh, you know, that should cover it, I would think. Make application within 30 days. and. Uh, got to make application once application is made once they're accepted they've got to uh, they've got to enroll in the program I mean that that allows for extraordinary circumstances and we all know there are extraordinary circumstances we're going through one right now so thank you thank you counselor uh, further uh, further thoughts before we uh, well I guess further thoughts from either of you Okay. Any other thoughts from the council before we uh, start to uh, vote on amendments? Madam Clerk. Sure. So, so just for clarification, I just want to review. My understanding is we only have amendments in subsections B and I. Everything else the council seemed to be okay with. I know the um, J we need to renumber that I'm sort of viewing that as just an, a staff internal housekeeping that we can fix the numbering for you. That's not a substantive change. So really the only sections that have amendments that will go through are B and I, but everything else, I didn't hear any comments about any of those other subsections, but please correct me if I'm wrong and then we're well, Jay, we said the numbering we're just going to no, do and adding two things to the exemption list. So three and five. Right, yes. but that's going to come from I. So right, but basically it's okay. B. It's J. I and J. Yeah. But all the other sections seem to be fine. So okay, so great. So um, for section B, um, Councilor LaChapelle sort of withdrew for the moment the change regarding the age for 21 to 18. So then 
the proposed amendment for section B would be to change the definition of homeless family to remove the language that is printed in the book now and to replace it with parent slash parents slash legal guardians of a child slash youth. And that would be the amendment before you. So basically it was moved by Councillor La Chapelle and would be seconded by another councillor and then you would have that discussion and vote on that item, Mr. Mayor. Can you repeat that amendment one more time, please? Sure, and I'm certainly, uh, Councillor La Chapelle can correct me, but my understanding it is parent slash parents, plural, slash legal guardian of a child slash youth. Uh, and so this, so somebody like uh, Councillor Scott's uh, example um, would not qualify, like an older brother watching a younger sibling, or, or perhaps um, you know an uncle that did not have legal guardianship. I, I'm not sure that I can answer that question okay. legally. All right. I yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the word legal. Councilor LaChapelle, would you like to uh, May I ask weigh Councilor in? Councilor Scott, a question in regards to this exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, when you when you enrolled this young person into the school system, um, did you you were the contact person? Did you have Correct. to go and you were were you ever? Con we never had any legal documentation done. No, it was we were we brought him to school to enroll. We were the contact person. We were his considered his guardians. We never had anything legally done. I know it's unusual, but that's the situation. His grandmother did live in town. We had a conversation with her. She never had to call the school. The school knew that we were the people that they contacted if something came up. That's just the way it was. I signed his athletic papers, everything. So I was just looking at the points to give somebody else that mm -hmm. opportunity. So if we dropped legal and just put guardian, guardian. there, mm -hmm. it, it would be sufficient? Because I think that would play into to, an older sibling with I mean, if I've got my 27-year-old daughter taking care of my 16-year-old son, none of us are in place, right? That would be that, right? She would be his guardian. She's an adult, okay. right? So we can, I, I would move to just eliminate the legal and just say guardian. Okay. If it's please, so pleases the council. I was going to say the court. <laughs> Mayor Gilbert? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor LaChapelle, thank you. Um, Councillor uh, Scott, did you have something to add? No. Or Councillor Harriman, sorry. Um, so just before we vote, if, if it could be read back starting from homeless family means, um, I would appreciate that sure. before we vote. Sure, right, I think you're right, Councillor. It would be homeless family means parent slash parent slash guardian of a youth, of a child slash youth. That wouldn't include the child. Oh, it does. Could read with. Along with. And their child. Or along with. Child children. 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 Yeah. And children. their children. Yeah. And their children. Or children. So parent slash parent slash guardian and their children. With at least child. one or more child or youth? Mm. Yeah, one or more child. Gets a little... Their children could be uh, not youth, though. Well, you, but you would be looking at the homeless definition of, excuse me, the definition of homeless children or youth then? Correct. Okay, so homeless children or youth. So homeless children are part of a homeless family. A homeless family is going to be this parent, parents, guardian. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Clement. Perhaps a suggestion, the wording on that, homeless family means two or more persons who are within the following degrees of relationship and include at least one or more children or youth, parent, parents, Guardian, I mean, you, leaving the first part of that in there, indicating that two or more persons who are within the following degree of relationship, parent, parents, guardian of one or more children or youth. 
two or four. Uh, All right, Councillor Lushabel. That that sounds like when you say two or more that fall into that. Now we're saying uh, you have two parents and the grandparent that wants to come in. I'm saying so. Just as as Director Hedegar said, or whatever, just go exactly what it is one mm -hmm. or more children. Just add it right to the end. One or that more covers children. Covers father and mother. What? Parent. Plus, parents. Yeah, parent, guardian. parents, yep. guardian, or guardian, yeah. or guardian, not parent, parents. So if they're not watching the kid, they they can't come with the guardian with the parents and no parent, parents, or guardian with one or more youth. Children. Yes. Children. Children. I think that's how you phrase it director yeah I was just I was referring to our definition of homeless children or youth so right. yes one or more children or youth and that would cover if there were a guardian of one child and had three of their own that covers everybody uh, madam clerk did you uh, get all that uh, I'm not sure let me see so homeless fam homeless families mean Homeless family means one or two parents slash parents slash guardians of one or more homeless children. Or guardians. Or guardians. Or guardians. Parents slash parents or guardian of one or more homeless children. Yep. Perfect. Sounds like it. Further discussion before uh, we vote? We will need a second on or that, Mr. Mayor. Do we if have a second? A second, or a second. Thank you, Councilor. Did you, Councilor Herman? Did you have something done? Yes. Just before we vote, if if the whole definition could be read from homeless family means. Sure. I, so I believe it is homeless family means one or two parents slash parent parents or guardian of one or more homeless children. Or youth. I would add to that. Children or youth. Children. Okay, so that then that would eliminate um, that would eliminate, say, a, a family that's made up of a, a mother, a grandmother, and a child, or um, a mother and an adult child and a youth or child. That would eliminate them from being able to access. The, it sounds if that's. Is that the intent? I mean, I don't know if the wording is just. Uh, Councilor Lashaba. Uh, yes, that's the intent. If if the twenty your twenty six year old daughter, I'm just picking on you. Your twenty six year old daughter and your sixteen year old. God forbid something happened. You go with your sixteen year old to the shelter. The twenty six year old goes to the other shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, she's twenty six years old. Uh, there's there's some personal responsibility. My intent. I think our intent was to try to take care of the most vulnerable people is the youth, the young youth of our society. At 26 years old, you're not a young youth. I want to make sure that fifth grader, sixth grader, or whatever, that we can put as many of them into a safe place as possible. And I do not want to take up beds from an aunt, uncle, grandparent, 26-year-old sibling. Um, that should be saved for the most vulnerable. Thank you. Uh, Council Harriman. Thank you. So, so if a mom, let's say a, a mom takes care of her kid and her elderly parent, and they become homeless, then they would not be allowed to access the youth shelter, even though they're, they are a homeless family with a youth in the family. I mean, it, it sounds like, I don't know if the wording is just incorrect or if that is the intent, but you know it just it's it's a family I just don't see how you can say this family is can use the family shelter and this family can't use the family shelter so I'm just trying to see if that's the intent of this definition or if there's something being lost in translation I've made my statement three times uh, Okay. Uh, do we have a second on this motion? You do. Uh, yeah. Councillor uh, McCarthy. 
And um, Madam Clerk, uh, can you please read it from the top and then call the vote? Sure. Uh, so it's moved by Councillor LaChapelle, seconded by Councillor McCarthy to change the definition of homeless family to remove the definition that's pre-printed in your book and to insert with it uh, homeless family means one or two parents slash parents or guardian of one or more homeless children or youth. Yes, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2. Yes. Ward 3. No. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. Yes. Ward 6. Yes. Ward 1. Yes. Mr. Mayor. No. Motion passed by vote of 5 to 2. The next item would be in I. Um, let me see here which uh, Councillor McCarthy uh, recommended uh, on page 7, I2, to remove number 3, I'm sorry, 3, staffing, to remove number 3 from that list and to put it into J. No. 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 They're keeping that. So in J, you are adding number 3 and potentially number 5. Okay. Yes. As exceptions. Okay, so would three stay in I, but just be added to J? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. And five would stay in I, just added to J. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So that would stay in J, and that would stay in J. So um, in f under I, then it would be 11 for beds to eliminate that altogether. And that was a suggestion by Councilor LaChapelle to eliminate um, 11 altogether. So I think that would be the next one, Mr. Mayor. That would be before you. Uh, do we have a uh, second? Uh, Councilor Clement, did you second? I'll second. Me, you seconded. Um, and uh, I, yeah, any other further thoughts on that? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Uh, Councillor from Ward 2. Yes. Ward 3. Yes. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. Yes. Ward 6. Yes. Ward 1. Yes. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Um, and then the... Y yes, are we up to the exceptions now? Okay. We still have the education right, piece. Right, That'll be last. Right. Um, so yes, Mr. Mayor. So uh, we're at J, and are we going to be the language in I three regarding staffing? We will add that to J. Is that the? Yeah. So I think the recommendation, Mr. Mayor, from Councilor McCarthy was to take the language on page seven, section I. Three regarding staffing and add it to J. Correct. As an exception. Do we have a second? As an exception. Second. Councillor, uh, or Councillor uh, Lachapelle, did you have something? Just a question. Uh, are we going to vote on each one of these separately? I would say yes. so. Right. Yes. Can we put three, five, six, seven, and ten? No. Because you well, already, all we're doing is adding five. We're making the suggestion of adding three and five. That's the only thing different, adding it to the And you're removing 11. And we're, removing, and we're removing 11. So so the only, so we don't have to vote on 6, 7, or 10. No. No. Because they're already there. Right. We're voting on, uh, we're voting on 3 right now. Is there a problem with 3 and 5, just putting them together, guys? Yeah, they're separate issues. Yeah, I would like to keep them separate. Okay, so I'd like to vote on every line of this thing when it comes to voting. That's how ridiculous that sounds. Uh, I have noted uh, Councillor Clement's second uh, for this. Um, it, did you second, Councillor Clement? I'm debating whether I'll withdraw my second or not. Just give me a moment. The time is taken. I'll second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please um, read the amendment and then call the vote. Sure. So the amendment is to um, add into Section J the exception that is outlined in Section I-3 regarding staffing. Correct. Please call the vote. 
Counselor from Ward 2. Yes. Ward 3. Yes. Ward 4. Yes. Ward 5. Yes. Ward 6. Yes. Ward 1. Yes. And Mr. Mayor. Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. And then uh, same thing in Section J. It would be adding Section I-5 regarding coordinated entry system. Uh, Councilor Herman, did you have something to add? Thank you. Um, I, I don't believe we heard from our presenters on that item, and I don't know if that's because there weren't strong feelings either way or if it was overlooked. And I was curious about that myself. If, you know, I know that was a strong recommendation from the shelter committee that the, that the shelters participate in that so that, um, you know, to better serve their guests. But um, I don't know if there was a strong feeling either way from either of you. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Councillor Clement. Point of order, the Councillor has no standing to question the committee at this point. We're in a position to vote on an item. Thank you. Uh, we, we have not moved the question, Councillor Clement. Uh, I'm sorry, sir? We have not moved the question. I believe we moved the question. I, I may be mistaken. We, we, we have not. Okay. Um, Mr. Sotomayor, um, do you care to weigh in on um, five? I, I don't think I have much more to say than, um, you know, the, the shelter committee made our recommendation. There's the five-year ramp-up period. I think I, ideally shelter services, uh, you know, these services are being offered at every shelter. Um, I, I didn't speak as much to, I put my energy into the items that I thought would be of greatest concern of highest interest. Um, so if the council chooses to, whichever way the council chooses to go along with this, I think, you know, we're still making progress together. Thank you. Um, may I have a, a second? Second. Uh, well, was this your amendment, Councillor McCarthy? No. no. Okay. Councillor McCarthy seconds. Yes, it was Councilor LaChapelle's and then seconded okay. by Councilor McCarthy. Perfect. Um, please uh, read the amendment and then uh, call the vote. Sure. So the amendment is to add to Section J under exemptions um, the language in five, um, I-5 regarding coordinated entry system. Uh, Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? No. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? No. Motion passed by vote of five to two. And then I think the last uh, section would be regarding the addition of the, the language that the city administrator recommended, which was within 30 days of entry to the shelter, uh, the youth shall make application to enroll in an educational program. And we're just sort of looking as to where that might go in the ordinance so i would suggest under i and since we took 11 out it would be number 15 would be the addition for that we uh there's some uh i apologize uh there's some question about whether we voted on 11 but i think we have uh, yes Madam you Clerk. have yeah, yeah. It, it was five to two to eliminate it altogether. Okay. Yes. Oh, the oh, I'm sorry, I can't read my writing here. No, that was se uh, yeah, seven. To it was zero. seven zero. Yeah. 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 You, you voted for it, Councilor McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Administrator Hunter, please proceed. So it would become the new 15 yeah. under I. <laughs> In other words, we're renumbering everything. Right. Okay. Renumbering 12, 13, 14, and 15, yeah. dropping them down one and adding this at the end of that. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, and we're, we're okay with uh, uh, application? No. Okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, can you please uh, read the amendment and then call the vote? Sure. And actually, I'm sorry, I guess I'm not quite sure who's going to make that motion and second oh, it. Uh, Sorry about that. Was it Councilor Council Lachapelle? Uh, and then Councilor McCarthy seconded it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yes, so the language would be um, inserted on page 8, section I 15, 
within 30 days of entry to the shelter, the youth shall make application to enroll in an educational program. Yeah. Councilor from Sorry, please call the vote. Oh, sure. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Was that the last amendment, Madam Clerk? It was the last amendment. And are we ready to vote uh, on the, the entire ordinance at this point? Uh, we are, yes, sir. I just need to find my papers. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, um, so the motion uh, before you again, which would be printed in your book, is that the proposed amendments to Chapter 22, Business Licenses, Article 16, Homeless Shelters of the City's Code of Ordinances, receive first passage by a roll call vote and that the public hearing on said ordinance be continued to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting. Madam, uh, may I have a motion? motion. Councilor Pease. Seconded Second. by Councilor Clement. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? I'm sorry, Ward 1? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will uh, stand at ease uh, for a few minutes here with the council's consent.
and uh, hello, yes, and we're back. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to those still watching at home. Uh, uh, next agenda item, Madam Clerk. Yes, uh, item number 12, public hearing and first passage to amend the zoning and land use code for purposes of defining homeless shelters, creating a homeless shelter overlay district, and parking requirements for homeless shelters. Requested action that the proposed amendments to Appendix A, Article 2, Section 2, Definitions, Article 11, District Regulations, Section 24, Subsection 6, Homeless Shelter Overlay District, and Article 12, Section 17D, Off Street Parking Required of the City's Zoning and Land Use Code receive first passage by a roll call vote and that the public hearing on said ordinance amendments be continued to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Uh, <coughs> Councilor McCarthy. Second. Second by Councilor LaChapelle. Uh, Director Hedegar, do you want to kick us off with anything or? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, and um, if the man in the closet could pull up the screen, <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be great. The man behind the curtain. Yeah, the man behind the curtain, the wonderful eyes, the wonderful Gudis. Mr. Gudis, we appreciate you. So. Um, so as a reminder, currently shelters are allowed as a conditional use in the neighborhood conservation B and NC uh, downtown residential district. And we'll see that on our screen in a second. Um, the shelter committee suggested um, expanding that into a number of other districts, including the urban enterprise, the Saunterville, the mill, and the riverfront district. Um, those are all zones that are not necessarily limited to the downtown, but they're found in the downtown area. Um, Craig may want to expand upon this, but part of the thought was that those areas in the downtown are the highest concentrations of where there's existing homeless activity, close to services, resources, those areas should be included. Um, it'd be helpful if that map showed up. <laughs> um, we discussed at the last meeting whether or not to include all of those districts or create an overlay. So the map that's in your packet, um, I created an overlay because I think there was some discussion as to whether or not it made sense to include like the urban enterprise that extended all the way out to exit 80 to have that in that, those areas. So the map you have before you in your packet tonight shows an overlay district that's limited to the downtown area and my thought was we would maybe look at some of those areas to consider whether or not they should be included or not. This section of the ordinance will require a recommendation from the planning board. So um, a couple scenarios might play out here. You folks may be okay with what's been presented now. Um, that is what's been presented to the planning board for proper purposes of extending this So if you guys would like to make a motion, that'd be great. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I guess to talk about the possible scenarios, the map that's presented to you folks tonight in your package has been scheduled for the planning board's consideration um, on Monday night. Right. You folks may agree with that. You may, folks may not agree with that. If you don't agree with that, you could set a recommendation for the planning board's consideration on Monday night, a revised zoning boundary. Monday night, they'll be looking at what they were originally scheduled to, to consider. They would also consider potentially an amendment from you folks. And then a third outcome of that could be, well, they're gonna have their own recommendation, which means that at the second reading on the 20th, you folks would have a number of scenarios to potentially consider at that time. That's great, except it's not what we had up before. <laughs> um, so bear with me here. We got to go to the city's website. Oh, 
Please. Perfect. There we go. Oh, Bang. Okay. Um, I apologize. I should have downloaded this as a separate file. It's not going to be as easy to navigate on this page as I as I would prefer it to be. Um, so again, uh, if you're following my cursor up there, um, it is currently allowed in the green district. Shelters are allowed in the downtown residential and the neighborhood conservation B districts. So neighborhood conservation B where the cursor is right now would be like the Summer Street, Spring Street neighborhood, um, the back side of Main Street. This is the Bates College neighborhood over here. I guess you could say college and uh, Campus Avenue area. And then downtown residential would be your tree streets. That's where it is currently allowed as a conditional use. Again, the committee was talking about encompassing the Sontraville, the mill, the riverfront, and the urban enterprise. What this map shows, this map shows all of those areas that are in the mill, in the riverfront, in the Sontraville. It does not show all the urban enterprise that exists throughout the community. I can pull that up on a different map if necessary, but the UE also extends further down Lincoln Street all the way out to exit 80. We threw out the idea of an overlay at the last meeting, so that's what I've done here. And then basically this red hatched line that you see going around this entire area here would be the overlay district that would allow shelters to occur. There are a couple areas that are not currently zoned for shelters that I've included, maybe this area here that I'm highlighting. Um, that's, uh, what street is that? Oak Street, I believe, kind of behind like 7-Eleven on Main Street. That's a section right now that's zoned community business. We would include that area potentially in the overlay district. The line going through here that line actually represents an overlay district. So um, while it's all NCB, technically on this side of the NCB where I'm, or I have the cursor right now, that's a lodging house overlay district where lodging houses are not permitted. That's a, uh, an overlay that the council approved a number of years ago in response to the number of homes being converted in the Bates right. College neighborhood. And so even though this is all NCB here, and shelters are currently all allowed in this entire NCB area. You're not allowed to do lodging houses in this area here. So my thought was, if we're not allowing lodging houses in that area, why would we allow shelters? So shelters would be limited on the, on the south side of that line. Um, from there, we're just following existing zoning boundaries. It isn't very pretty on this map, and we would definitely pr make that, refine that. But this jagged line is basically following the existing boundary of the downtown residential. Same thing here as we go along this area. We're now down at the uh, intersection of Birch and Bartlett Street down here. This area that's in white right now is actually zoned highway business. There's this little pocket of highway business down there where um, it's a couple of um, a lodging house, Mayot Sausage, the mosque, a multifamily. Um, the thought would be just to include that area again we're already in the neighborhood. Why aren't we including that for shelters? And we have a property that has a that has a contract zone for a lodging house down there. So why wouldn't we include that as well? Going up Bartlett Street, we're following the zoning boundaries again. Going around a section of UE that's kind of on the back side of Public Works. Going on the back side of the Pepperell Mill. Now at Lisbon Street, we're by Grimmels. We're behind Grimmels. We're following a line here, uh, an existing zoning line again for the UE. And then when we get down to here, this UE actually continues down along the river and it gets into a much larger area around um, exit 80. Didn't include that in the overlay. I didn't think that that was what the council was looking at. I'm not sure that that's what the committee was thinking about either. And then we just follow the boundary all the way back to the top, um, all the way along the river. I did not include where Pineland Lumber is. As you folks know, that section was rezoned there um, to allow for the Saxon development. So I didn't include that area there. And then again, continuing with the, the um, NCB. There is UE, as you can see on the top of the screen here, that UE extends on the other side of the uh, Veterans Bridge, uh, Strawberry Avenue, where uh, Humane Society is, that area did not include that area in there. 
So that's what you have before you tonight. The thought is to get some input. If we're good with that, then we send it forward to the planning board for them to make a recommendation to you folks. Um, they can change it. They could send this recommendation back however they may see fit. And then you folks would take action on the 20th. I'm not sure if Craig has anything to add at this point, given that we've created an overlay versus encompassing all those districts. The only thing I would add is that the overlay, I think, meets the general spirit of what was recommended. Thank you both. Uh, Councilor LaChapelle. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh. Um, again, oh, did you have something else? I did have something else. I'm sorry I, um, if I can interrupt. Um, just some history here, too, um, which is important to note. There was a time when we allowed, um, part of the reason we ended up with the NCB and the DR um, for the shelters was back in 2010, we made an amendment to address um, lodging houses. Lodging houses and boarding houses, which were essentially the same use at that time, the only difference between the two was boarding may provide meals and lodging houses did not provide meals. At that time, we allowed one or both of those uses in six different zoning districts throughout the city. Um, there was concern at that time about lodging houses expanding along uh, Lisbon Street, which is now the Sancherville District, so kind of this area here that I'm running the cursor on. So the council at that time adopted an ordinance that basically put all lodging houses into the NCB and DR District, and that's when we came up with the definition that exists today for shelters. The concern at the time was we didn't want to see lodging houses on Lisbon Street. So um, that's an important factor, I think, for the council to consider here in that if we just do a blanket um, acceptance of what the, count, uh, the committee was suggesting as far as including these zoning districts, that would allow a shelter to operate on Lisbon Street along our commercial corridor and allow one on Lincoln Street in a riverfront area. I'm not sure that that's what the council is going to want to do. I'm not sure that's what the planning board is going to want to do, given actions that were taken, you know, over 10 years ago at this point. The reality is that maybe, given the, some of the performance standards, we eliminated the performance standards on the ordinance you just acted upon. We, there was setbacks from parks in there, but there's no longer parks. It's schools now in there, um, in daycares. I'm not sure about daycares, but there's no schools in this immediate area down there. So I think that's important for you folks to recognize that as drafted, this would potentially not have any limitations in those areas. So while it probably makes sense to expand maybe the footprint where shelters can occur, the council really needs to think about where in this overlay is an appropriate area. So sorry for the interruption there. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Director Heidegger, on the map, would you point out where Central Maine Medical Center would be? Central Maine Medical Center is right there. NCB, oh, Central Maine Medical Center is right there. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They got plot of land. That's them. This is like the where the, heli, the airport, airport, heliport is. <laughs> um, and then Lowell Square would be down here, Can, uh, Dempsey Center. So this line coming up, is that Main Street? Where is Main, Main Street, Street is right here. Right there. Okay. Railroad tracks is this line right here. Oh, I, I have multiple concerns, as you probably figured I would. Um, I, I would make some major recommendations on changing this. I want to eliminate anything along the riverside uh, altogether. Um, may I get up, Mr. Mayor, and just point out? Uh, I, I, I would suggest following up Main Street. Main Street, you're seeing right here is CMMC? Correct. Bring the line up here. Nothing on this side. If you're coming up, coming across, I don't care. Following it down, that's fine. Coming. And where where is this? This is a Willow Circle is, behind Public, Public Works. Works. Public Works. So Public Works is actually this lot right here. Coming down here, I'm assuming this is Park Street right here. Uh, that's Lisbon Street right there. Okay, excuse me. This is Park. Correct. Okay, so coming down. Getting, picking up on Park Street and mm -hmm. coming back up to Main Street, eliminating all this area. We're looking for, we have possibility of major development into this area. We're looking at redoing the waterfront. 
uh, rooming houses or shelters, I do not believe we should have in this area. Um, if, if we're looking, this is this is East Avenue? Webster. What, this is Webster Street right here? Correct. What is this street? East. It's East, Avenue. It's East Avenue. Correct. The high school. This is the high Street. school. Yeah, Correct. So I'm saying, even if it's easier, you're just coming down like this. You're not developing anything there anyway. You just, um, but I, I would eliminate all this and bring it up here. I thought CMMC was up that far. Uh, Sunnyside. Definitely. Yes. Where's Sunnyside? Park? Sunnyside's uh, up a little further. This lot right here. Is it there? Where yeah. Where is uh, Tall Pines? Tall Pines is off the map. Alpines is Over up there. here. <laughs> I can I can throw the the if it's helpful. So um, I and I guess I'll, I would refer to council from too, um, so. Ward One. Um, I, I just wanted to eliminate <coughs> anything along the water um, and just keep that for development and and, and I'm, the rooming houses the same thing not on the water. This is it's a different. Know if this is helpful because I can navigate more of the city if, if necessary. So I, I just where you know, Main Street, yep. all this, sure. Sunnyside Park down, Sunnyside Park down, right here. Eliminate all of that. Just come up Main Street and cut across wherever you had that line before. I think you were up here. Yeah. Now you make it tough for me to read. <laughs> <laughs> but just go up Main Street wherever yep, that you, is. You were talking about the Main Street. I think this is either Holland or Whipple. I'd have to check which one that Go is. Go Main Street, hit that, come across, just basically do a little loop, hit Park Street, come right up there. Just keeping it into that area. Um, and if, if other people feel the, the higher up on Main Street is what they want, I, I don't know, but that would be my, my thoughts, and I would, uh, I would speak with... Uh, Ward one representative, because um, that's a, a big part in your ward. Anything further, uh, Councillor Lasher? No, not at the moment. Thank you, sir. Councillor Harriman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I understand the concern about um, about development along the river. I feel like that that mill uh, zoning district could have a lot of useful space in there that could be used, um, you know, for a shelter. There's Mill yeah, district? yeah, M, so. the, which is, yeah, right there. That's the mill zoning district, I believe. I feel like there's, if we cut that out, that cuts out a lot of, um, you know, pretty useful space with some, um, yeah, some unused buildings, and I don't know if they would be developed as a shelter, but it seems like, a, like that proposal really shrinks things down a lot. Do we have a current picture of the, I'm asking Mr. Mayor, do we have a current picture of what the old, the old thing which has been the green, is the green, that was it? Yeah, the, 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 the green area is where the shelters are currently allowed right now. Right, okay. Current, currently. Currently, correct. 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 Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. So, just a reminder, the original proposal that came to us at the beginning of this year was in that green on Sabata Street, right? right? So you still want to include part of that. It was right around here. Correct. It was right around where it's right on the corner. Where the cursor is right now. And also, I would, so immediately behind the hospital, not on the river, I, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying on the river, like where the Pineland Lumber possibility of that, particularly on the riverfront district area down here closer to on the other side of Canal right Lincoln Street down that area but I think that there's some potential for some areas up in that section cautiously I think and I would like to hear the planning boards sorry what, on what that. section counselor it, directly behind the hospital not necessarily all the way down to the river but directly behind the hospital, behind, I'm thinking where the ch the school, the private school is right there, uh, um, across uh, from Rainbow, right? It, 
behind there somewhere may be some possibility of some stuff because there are some like where Landry and Son is and some of those buildings next to there, I'm not sure if all of those are in use, but that might be a spot that could be potentially used and close to some of the facilities that people are requesting when it comes to a homeless shelter. So, I, and I think this is what's gonna happen here is we're gonna get spotty here because it's, if, especially if we start looking at some of that, if we're looking at the mill district area, when I'm looking over there and I'm thinking where Cedar Street connects to Lincoln Street where we have Hope Haven now already and some of the buildings down there across the street from the Pepperell Mill, I can't remember the name of that mill over there where uh, LePage Bakery is. Anders Coggin. Anders, is that uh, the Anders Coggin? No, uh, the like Hill the, Mill? Where the, where, the Hill No, 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 I'm thinking down mill? on Lincoln Street over by where Grimmel's Garage is on Lisbon Street, that mill that's just before that one. Andrew's Garage. That's Andrew's. Yeah, that's mine, Sam's. Okay, well, I was thinking maybe something there that would that be something that would be considered a riverfront thing? And, that, and that's why I'd like to get the planning board to have a little more conversation on this because I think it is kind of piecemeal. And if we're going to be picking and choosing, we've already got, I hear what you're saying. I have already talked to businesses in the community on Lisbon Street, on Sabata Street. They're, they really are very concerned about it going on Lisbon Street from right where the sign is, where Mr. Drew, you know where that is, where VIP all the way down to Main Street. Large concerns with something like that going there. So I wouldn't disagree with that. I think every business that I've talked to down there had concerns about that and some of them on Main Street and some on Sabata Street. I think when we're looking at our corridors, that was where part of this conversation all originally stemmed from. So, but I also don't want to eliminate some of the spots that may be good and viable for, I mean, I understand behind I, the peck built, there's possible things that might be happening in that particular area. We want to be careful about where we're going to put something if it's going to go over there. Because the potential for development there is huge if we get the right person to come in and make a development to come into that particular area. So I feel like I'm all over the place here and I'm not really saying anything correct, like specific, but I think we need to be very careful and I would really like to hear the planning board's conversation around this as we're going forward too. Thank you. Sorry. Uh Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and just to just to clarify, Director Hedegger, uh, so no matter what zones we have here, all all um, uh, permits, uh, all licensing and permits would need to be approved by the council. Correct. Right. So yes. So there. You know, there could be buildings that would make, like, might be in the wrong, um, you know, just uh, the wrong zone, so to speak, but might make sense. Um, and I, I would just like to, um, I guess, uh, mention it to the council that all um, all shelters will need to be approved regardless of where this is. And, and for what it's worth, I mean, the overlay doesn't have to be the, this one polygon, right? I mean, we can have a section that you know, maybe addresses some of your concerns and some of your concerns. So we can have multiple overlays addressing this issue. So Non-contiguous overlays. Is correct. So if yes. there's a concern about Lisbon Street, which I think is something you folks need to be strongly consider, great, that's not in the overlay, but you could have the overlay on either side of that if that was appropriate. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I happen to agree with Council LaChapelle. I think his drawing the line at uh, Park Street and Lisbon Street, uh, take the Mill District and the Riverfront out of this is the proper way to go. Uh, we're trying to develop that. We're trying to encourage people to, you know, people with the deep pockets to come in and develop housing and develop businesses and everything else. And I think that to uh, zone it for a a homeless shelter right in the middle of where you're trying to develop, I think, would be a big mistake on our part. If you look at where even taking that section out of it, we're adding areas where they can put a shelter. So we're not contracting the 
contracting the zone that's available now or expanding the zone that's available now and by changing some of the language we've expanded within the existing zone where one could go so i think with those changes that we've made i think that we should definitely go with uh, council la chapelle's recommendation thank you uh, councillor clement thank you mr mayor uh, i will concur in part I, I can't say that i can do all of it because i'm trying to look at this map and i just can't make out one area here but certainly the riverfront and the mill district should be removed from the overlay uh, those are two areas that are prime. Uh, I don't think it would behoove us to put something like that in that district. If we were to come down the, looking at the map, the right-hand side of the mill district, including the, uh, the current allowed area, come down, take that area of Union, uh, the Enterprise, and the CV district, all the way down to the end of the downtown residential back up and over as you show it there would be fine We've, we're almost doubling the allowed area uh, I've heard concerns that we just too much area in this uh, overlay district but I certainly don't see allowing anything in the riverfront or the mill district I think those are two areas that we want to save for for development I mean uh, I, I just can't see including that thank you mr. mayor um, uh, yes director um, curious if people um, you know one of the suggestions was to you know follow this line around this area this is all mill here sorry I'm, again, I'm, I'm on the cursor to... sorry um, <laughs> this is public works this is the pepperell mill this is, is Lisbon Street um, this is Park Street any reason why we want to include the the pepperell mill may be in this in this area i only raise that because we, we're talking about discounting the mill and the riverfront entirely and not that public works is going anywhere soon um but if these areas were included again that provides maybe some more opportunities particularly with the pepperell mill yeah. that's uh um yeah sounding like that might be okay uh, Councilor LaChapelle will approach the map. Uh, so, yes, that's fine. Come right down to Pepper Mill. Just include the Pepper Mill. Come back up here to Park Street. Follow Park all the way to Main Street. Come up Main Street. I was going to say, originally, I was going to say anything south of CMMC all the way to the river. Eliminate altogether. So this whole section, nothing for it. Sunny Park is right. What, what's uh, Sunnyside? Sunnyside is right here. Yep. So I, I was really going to go like that, but th there's there's just so great potential for development in this area that people are looking at it right now. So I would say Sunny Park down. So come up Main Street, just draw a line wherever this is, and come across. I'm I'm fine if you want to go up there. Also, I, I don't see a need to go that far north, and I, and I, I was just going to cut it across, cut it across, follow pretty much follow this line, and just Park Street. So this and that would be. Um, if, if I may, Councilor, please. So uh, we're going to do do that basically. Yes. Okay. Yes, and it include. Yeah, just include this, get rid of it right here, because this is a, now, this is Lincoln Street, uh, is this Lincoln Street right here? Correct. So we're, we're already in a discussion with a couple of developers on the possibility of putting condos overlooking the river and just working that whole area. Uh, so then that's, it uh, that just becomes a, not going to invest a large amount of money in an area that we have homeless shelter next door from trying to sell five hundred thousand dollar four hundred thousand dollar condos councillor sorry councillor uh thank you no okay uh councillor scott did you have something further to add i did um 
So just for clarification's sake, when you're going to bring these recommendations to the planning board, the planning board's then going to look at it, can possibly make their own recommendations, and come back to us on 920 to have our second reading on this, correct? Correct. I just wanted to make sure. The way sure. I see it now, they have this initial proposal in front of them, so they need to make a recommendation on the initial proposal. Mm -hmm. They're going to make a recommendation if there's a motion tonight to change that proposal. And they're going to either act on either one of those or they're going to make their own recommendation altogether. Okay. But you will get a recommendation on any or all of these things coming back to you from the planning board. Okay. That's all uh, we had. I'm ready to move forward. Uh, Councilor McCarthy. Thank you. Um, but if we don't agree with the recommendation, what happens? If you... Um, if they give you a negative recommendation on what you propose, um, you need a supermajority to overturn uh, their recommendation. Okay, so they're gonna, they could send us back three different proposals with a check mark. They'll go with either one, or will they just send back one to us to either go with or deny? They should be sending you one. Right. So if we don't agree with that, then? You can overrule that, but you'll need a supermajority. Okay. They'll evaluate everything, uh, evaluate everything we send them, and then, and then come back with their single recommendation. Right. Which may be the same as yours or maybe something totally different. Okay. Thank you. When does the planning board meet? Monday. That's right. Okay. Uh, Councilor LaChapelle, do you? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would prefer just giving the planning board some what our thought process is now to incorporate our thoughts into their decision making. Because if I was on the planning board, I'd say, why didn't, I, why didn't you tell me what you were thinking before we sent that proposal over to you? So if we're giving them the, the rough outline that, and why we're thinking that, um, I think we're, it, it's gonna do both of us a favor, favor to them and a favor to us to move this project forward. So I recommend the recommendations that I had would be past that or send that recommendation to the planning board. I, um, yeah, I, I agree with Councillor LaChapelle. Um, I am a little bit concerned about, um, you know, reducing the size of the overlay, but I, I definitely understand the um, need to preserve uh, the riverfront and uh, development um, in our, um, you know, most advantageous uh, areas of the city. Uh, Councillor Harriman. Thank you. Um, so if I understand it, it sounds like the recommendation was to take from Sunnyside Park south um, out of the overlay, basically. And then, I mean, that's a big chunk of NCB, which is which currently allows shelters. We've got a, a chunk of NCB in the... Uh, you know, sort of south of Bates College that's being taken out as well, which currently allows shelters. And then if we don't, you know, downtown residential is mostly untouched there. But then if we don't really add much more in, we're not, if we're taking those chunks out and not adding anything, or not adding much more in, we're not really increasing the amount of space where it's available and, um, I, th I would prefer to just go with the shelter committee's recommendations of adding these, adding these zones with some consideration to the riverfront, um, you know, the, that riverfront area and Lisbon Street as well. But I feel like cutting out all of that NCB over there on on the river side of Main Street, and then cutting out this section here, um, south of Bates College. It just, I, I don't know the exact. You know acreage there but it seems like we're not moving we're not moving much from what we currently have allowed thank you uh council chapelle did council you uh Chappelle. have a point oh, this i'm i'm open to the idea of going up the sunny side come right across follow this line just take all of ncd just come right down here and then just just incorporate this little part and all of ncb so just incorporate that into the into the housing so i know you have to discern that coming out so just come up 
Main Street, wherever Sunnyside Park is right here, uh, off of Main Street, just to the right-hand side, connect it up with this, follow that line, come right down here, do this, come over to the Bethel Mill, yeah. and then come up to uh, Park Street, uh, yeah. Park Street, come all the way across, yep. right over to this day. So we're just eliminating this, we're adding that into it. So put that into the into that zone. So you're just making it a larger circle. And you know, right. it could you could follow this, but nobody's gonna develop right here anyways. You could have the hockey arena you know, it just I, looks like the masses. I don't know that I mean you you to your point you could go around Franklin Pasture, but it's yeah, be eliminated it, it, because it's, it doesn't matter. They're not going to build there. It yeah, just I mean, makes it look good for the boundary line. Yeah. Yeah. Councilors, thank you. Uh, Councilor LaChapelle? Yes, or, so uh, that's just to address uh, Councilman Herring's, Herring's concern. So certainly put the rest of the NCV up at the top, put it, that in there. So you're including this white area up here, just taking the line, bring it down. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Sorry. Yes, um, Administrator Hunter. I would just like to remind the viewing audience that the televised portion of the meeting ends at 11 o'clock. We will still be Video. recording the meeting, but I just wanted to let the viewing audience know that. I think it's extended to Okay. It may or may not go off at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and um, just in case if the viewing audience knows I, that. I we appreciate are still that, meeting. Administrator Hunter. It, you know, for our viewing audience at home, if you are still watching, I applaud you. And, uh, and if, you do, if we do go dark, just uh, grab your iPad and uh, find us on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, Councilor LaChapelle, was there anything else? No, I was just trying to address uh, right. Councilman Harris. No, absolutely, but were, were you finished? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, further comment from the Council at this point? We're all fairly comfortable with that. Did, uh, or Councilor Harriman? Um, sorry, I'd just like to see, a, like, you know, draw the line to see where, I couldn't quite tell where the line was going to go, right? yeah. um, I can be, attempt to be dangerous here. Whatever, we'll see what happens here. Um, Main Street is clear. I'm sorry, I'm wiggly here, right? I think you were saying we're going to go this way. I think you said we're going back up here. Oh, look at, and then we're coming straight across somewhere in this area here. I apologize. We're going to follow this line all the way yeah. through. We're doing that line all the way through. Council LaChapelle said maybe like do something in this area here. I haven't contemplated that because originally we were following the zoning line, but let's just say for conversations, we were going to connect the dots there. We're going to go like this. We're going to follow this all the way down here. We're going to do this. 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 We're going to follow Park Street all the way back to the beginning. And those are all going to be straight lines. <laughs> Or straighter and then so I was wondering about NCB on the river side of Main Street this side up here you're talking about mm -hmm. oh, well, cause you were, um, sorry uh, Councilor La Chapelle you were saying from sunny side down uh, so that would we would keep uh, above sunny side so in the overlay so you Certainly. so you could do basically all this area then up here is what you're, what I think Include that is what I'm hearing. Something that ugly is. Event. You're doing a fine job, um, <laughs> counselors. Uh, do you find that acceptable, or, or acceptable enough to send it to the or, council, Harriman? Yes. It just seems, just from looking at this, you know, if we're taking out NCB over there, um, you know, in the Summer Street, Spring Street area, and then we're adding this small portion of Centreville, and then this small portion of um, of either mill or I think it's mill there where the Pepperell Mill is. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem like we're doing what the shelter committee recommended as in adding more places to develop a shelter. It, it may be a small gain in, in land area, but it, um, yeah, it, it doesn't look like it adds very much. Mr. Mayor. Um. 
Councillor, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Herman or okay, uh, Councillor LaChapelle. I, I appreciate the the hard work and the dedication of the shelter committee, um, but I also have forty thousand other residents in the city of Lewiston that are concerned on it. I think this is hopefully a decent balance. It does expand the area that you can put uh, shelters in, but it also protects a larger area of the city that um, will put at ease a lot of the developers. So I, I, I thank the shelter committee for their, their effort, but um, ultimately I think this is um, a good compromise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, director, now that we've uh, um, kind of traced it out there, is, is that still up? Um, now that we've traced it out, uh, Director Hedegar and Mr. Saddlemeyer, uh, any any thoughts? Um, I don't have any additional comments at this point. Uh, I, I would simply uh, reiterate, I guess, that the, the idea was to make it more feasible to avoid concentration. Um, that that's that's the origin of the recommendation is um, if if concentration of shelters is a concern then how uh, you know can we allow more places where they could be um, and I think how the lines get drawn of course we know that uh, a lot of businesses individuals you know there's there's a lot of resistance to uh, shelters being located close by to uh, folks who have a lot invested or uh, you know a lot of money invested or things to that nature so it is hard to uh, find complete consensus on that um, and I think I'm stating the obvious at this point so I, 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 I also um, am curious to see what the planning board can come up with but I'll leave it at that thank you further thoughts from the council at this point before we vote uh, madam clerk we have a motion on the table correct um, you do yes sir do we do we need to vote on this overlay as an uh, sorry one second councillor peace did you have something to well, I'm just curious because you were talking about do you mind speaking to the mic sorry about that mr. mayor I just wanted them to know that this was drawn by Director Herrick, not the planning. Correct. Correct. Right. We're we're going to be getting their uh, feedback uh, in uh, less than a week. Uh, do uh, anything further, Councillor Peace. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we need to vote on um, you know this new traced out overlay as an amendment, or are we just sending? Are we voting to approve this and send it with this recommendation? What, what would be most appropriate? I'm going to ask Director Hedegar, but I think we do need to have a motion, a vote to um, approve the rough amendment. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's. I think I think uh, the clerk's right as far as. Technically, there's a, a map that's been presented out there, and you folks are looking to change that, um, even though it is that it sounds as though many of you are looking for the planning board for guidance as to go with that, and this would be a recommendation from the act upon. But what has been proposed is not, does not sound like is what's agreeable to the council, so you should be making a motion on a on an amended map, I guess, as represented. <laughs> um, and I think I have an understanding of what we're looking to do here. Excellent. Thank you, Director. Um, Councilor LaChapelle, would you like to make just such a motion? Yeah, I'm, I move that we make an amendment to the original motion to incorporate that. I'll suck it. That. <laughs> that. That's uh, hard. That's right. It's going to be yes. worth something. You can, you can get the wording down. After 10.30, right, it starts shutting down on me. I'm sure, sorry. just for the benefit of the public, which basically is to remove the Riverfront District, the Mill District, um, some of the Urban Enterprise District area around the Sunnyside Park, and then other areas as basically defined and depicted in the map. Correct. And I guess my thought with that is we, we will amend the map so that can be something, you know, as part of the motion so it's understood that this is right. what the, 
because we're going to need that for the planning board anyway to show them what you folks right. are actually suggesting. Yep. Uh, so, Councilor LaChapelle has proposed an, uh, an amendment, and uh, we, Councilor McCarthy has seconded it. And, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Or, oh, yeah, I apologize. Thank you. Um, we are now going to public comment. Hello, uh, Josh Van Aging, Ward 1. Um, first and foremost, I, I sit on the board of the Downtown Lewiston Association. Um, their recommendation was uh, an overlay that excluded Lisbon Street from uh, basically the Quaddy Mill to Main Street. So um, that would be one of the exceptions. Um, that would be part of the downtown, well, the, the, the downtown business corridor. Um, another thing, just to bring this up, um, what you've drawn out in NCB is actually the, the housing above Sunnyside Park is all single family units. Um, there, there's no possibility that any of those homes are, are going to be replaced with, with a boarding uh, facility anytime soon. Also, the urban enterprise zone, both below um, the um, uh, below the Veterans Memorial Bridge and above that vet, 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 uh, Veterans Memorial Bridge is somewhat of a wasted zone at this point. Um, th there's so many different opportunities for development, but nothing has happened to it. Um, it sits very close to the railroad tracks. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of underutilized buildings. Um, and you need to think about where the homeless people actually are located. Right now, we have a no barrier homeless shelter at Sunnyside Park, and it stretches all the way up to Tall Pines. Um, it's, it's called the Riverwalk, which should be an economic driver for our community. But unfortunately, it is currently housing at least 60 unhoused people. Um, same situation at Franklin Pastures. We have a large contingent of people who, who are in the woods um, around, around the uh, around the, um, the school. So when you think about Adams Way in that area, that's another location that would probably be well suited uh, for, for a homeless shelter. Because we're talking about areas that have been derelict, right? That, that there's a situation where no one is occupying those areas except for homeless people. So it's just something to think about when you're considering all of this. Um, putting the services where the people actually are congregating is going to help to eliminate the problem. And another thing just to bring up. In Portland, and I know Portland's a completely different market, but Milestones is a wet shelter. Uh, it sits on India Street um, in some of the primest condo units um, in, in the entire city. Um, so if you have the right solution to deal uh, with the homeless problem, it doesn't stop development. So those are just the points that I wanted to bring up. Further public comment? Back to the council. Um, council, are we uh, still prepared to vote? Yes. Yeah. Madam Clerk, we had a, a motion and a second, and uh, please call the vote. Sure, and this will be the vote on the amendment to uh, incorporate the new map. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? No. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? No. And uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by, <coughs> excuse me, by a vote of five to two. Uh, now the original motion is before you, which is the one that's printed in your book. Are you all set for that vote? Correct, please. Council uh, uh, yes. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? This is to uh, send it to planning, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is for the, this is including the text in the, in the appendix as well, the zoning and land use code? Yes, yeah, so the definitions, the sort of adjusted rough overlay, and then the off-street parking changes. Okay, yes. Thank you. Um, ward four? I'm sorry, I, and it's including the new map. Yes. yes. Yeah, we voted on that yes. amendment. Ward five? Yes. Ward six? Yes. Ward one? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Madam Clerk, next agenda item. Yes. Item number 13, public hearing and first passage to amend the animal ordinance and land use code regarding the keeping of chickens 
on lots developed with single family detached dwellings. Requested action that the proposed amendments to Chapter 14, Article 7, Division 4 of the Code of Ordinances and Appendix A, Article 11, Section 22 of the Zoning and Land Use Code of the City's Code of Ordinances receive first passage by a roll call vote and that the public hearing on said ordinance amendments be continued to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. May I have a motion, Back. please? Uh, second. Councillor uh, Clement, seconded by Councillor LaChapelle. Uh, discussion? Or did you need to start us off, Director <laughs> Um I think we're doing what the council was looking for here. I think there was general consensus. We reduced it from 30,000 to 15,000. We did not change the zoning districts. Um, that language is referenced both in the Code of Ordinances and the Zoning and Land Use Code. So there will be a requirement to get a recommendation from the council, uh, excuse me, from the planning board as well, because um, they're again referenced in both sections but um, 15,000 from 30,000 no change in districts uh, can you uh, is it possible to do a quick calculation like what does acreage look like 15,000 square feet is like what so an that? acre is 43,560 um, you know, so a third, like, third, a third of an acre yeah 100 by 100 is 10,000 right gotcha it's like three downtown blocks right okay um, yes, thank you, Director. Uh, anything further? Oh, sorry, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, discussion among the council? Uh, public comment at this point? Uh, back to the council? Uh, I, I will say, um, I didn't, well, I didn't uh, think that I'd be getting a chance to vote on this, but here I am. <laughs> And um, I did, um, thank you, um, uh, uh, Julia, uh, I did have a conversation uh, with her. And um, until the conversation, I didn't realize that other uh, cities um, much larger and denser than we um, have uh, these ordinances to, uh, I guess, very little ill effect. And so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be supporting uh, both of this as well, Bo both of these as well. Um, further comment? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Agenda item number 14. Item number 14. Public hearing and first passage to amend the animal ordinance regarding the keeping of bees in proximity to abutting properties. Requested action that the proposed amendments to Chapter 14, Article 7, Division 3 of the Code of Ordinances receive first passage by a roll call vote and that the public hearing on said ordinance amendments be continued to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. Move for passage. Uh, uh, Councilor uh, Clement followed by Councilor Pease. Uh, discussion? Councilor Harriman? Thank you. Um, I had a question on, um, so under Section 1432, Number 5, um, just a, a clarification of the distance. Um, so it says a minimum of 25 feet from inhabited dwelling um, other than that of the person keeping bees um, and may be not be closer. I think there's a typo there, but um, I'm trying to understand unless a flyway barrier is erected. So what, did we come to the conclusion that if you put the barrier up, you can put it anywhere um, on your property? Is that right, you're okay. right. There is a slight typo there. It should be and may not be closer unless that flyway barrier is erected. So 25 feet away from your neighbor's house, if you want to put it closer, you have to have a barrier up. Okay, okay, thank you. Could it then be right on the line? If they put a barrier up, they could, yes. Okay. Public comment? Back to the council. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed a vote of 7 to 0. Thank you, folks. Director thank Hedegaard, you. thank you very much. You stick around, we have more to go. I'm sorry, I was hoping, what, is it 11 yet? I want to be that person, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, agenda item number 15. Item number 15, public hearing and first passage regarding amendments to the elections ordinance for the redistricting of city ward boundary lines. Requested action that the proposed amendments to the city code of ordinances, chapter 32, elections, section 32-1, wards described, receive first passage by a roll call vote, and that the public hearing on said ordinance be continued to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting. So moved. Uh, uh, Councilor Harriman, followed by Second. Councilor Scott, uh, discussion? Anything you'd like to add, um, Madam Clerk? No, I'm just happy to answer questions. Okay. Uh, Councilor um, McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How did, the, how did you come up with these changes? Just what, what, I know why you had to do it, but the specific changes, what was the impetus by grabbing those small sections? Sure. Uh, obviously, it's a domino effect because all the wards are contiguous. So we started with the largest ward that needed to be changed accordingly and then just started moving out from there. And as you moved one, it forced the other ones because they're all connected. Um, so also keeping in mind the residents for the current elected officials, both school and city council, uh, locations for planning board, I'm sorry, locations for polling places, as well as the existing boundary lines for the state districts and the county commissioner districts, wanting to follow those to the extent that we could so we don't have lots of different jurisdictions. So we really just start with the largest ward that needs to be adjusted and then adjust in or out from there, which then forces the others accordingly. So it is a quite a balancing act and I'll give 100% credit to Jim Ward who's the city's GIS coordinator he just does it all on on screen and if this one doesn't work then you just sort of go back and try another one and it it, it will um, insert the population changes depending upon how he moves the lines block by block okay thank you public comment for this agenda item back to the council uh, Councillor Pease. Uh, my only thing is, is they, in my ward, they took all my single family homes out. All of the single family homes all are out of the single families on top of the second. Oh, I should say 80%. I mean, 20% doesn't sound so bad. Well, we're talking 280 people. Any thoughts on that, Madam Clerk? Um, not offhand, what we are going to bring you for final passage is individual maps of each ward so it's easier to read and see. Um, so that might might clarify a little more. I, we're happy to take a look at that, Councillor Pease, but I didn't realize that that would leave 100% rental units in all of Ward 5. That's what you're saying? Yeah. About 80%. 80%. 80%. 80% will be rental units, yeah. Again, a lot of it is also following the state boundary lines and the, the, and the county commissioner lines as well. Well, I know it's tough. I just wanted to make that comment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, have you already been to public comment for this agenda? We did, yes. Oh, okay. Um, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? No. Ward 5? No. Ward six? Yes, first reading only. Ward one? Yes. And Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of five to two. Agenda item number 16. Item number 16, order. Authorizing the city administrator to enter into a more uh, memorandum of understanding with Lewiston Auburn Water Pollution Control Authority for the design, permitting, construction, and operation of a new wet weather storage tank and agree to the cost apportionment. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to enter into a memorandum of understanding with Lewiston Auburn Water Pollution Control Authority for the design, permitting, construction, and operation of a new wet weather storage tank and agree to the cost apportionment. Uh, Councillor LaChapelle, seconded by Councillor Pease. Any discussion? Public comment? Back to the council. Just a quick question. Oh, uh, Councillor uh, McCarthy? Quick question. Where is this going to be located? <laughs> it is right 
near the um, existing Water Pollution Control Authority. I don't know if it's on that side of the road or, or the other side. Out of Lincoln Street? Yes, most definitely. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. And ward, uh, Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Agenda item number 17. Item number 17, order authorizing the acceptance of a utility easement from Timothy and Lisa Schwinnard through their property at 235 Bartlett Street and to allow the city administrator to execute the necessary documents. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the acceptance of a utility easement from Timothy and Lisa Schwinnard through their property at 235 Bartlett Street and allow the city administrator to execute the necessary documents. So moved. Uh, Councilor McCarthy, seconded by Councilor Harriman. Uh, discussion? Public comment? Back to the council. Uh, Councilor McCarthy, or Councilor Pease, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm assuming the uh, Schwinnards understand that this is their responsibility after this. Yeah, it has to be replaced. It's their cost. Yes, that was made clear to them. Okay. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, next agenda item. Item number uh, 18, request for donation of in-kind city services for the 13th annual Androscoggin Land Trust River Cleanup. Requested action to review the request submitted by Androscoggin Land Trust for an in-kind donation of city services totaling $345 and to determine a course of action. I have a motion, Councillor Pease. Second. Second by Councillor Scott. And um, yeah, discussion, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to thank our one person still left in the audience this evening because he stayed specifically for this and he and I did talk about this and I appreciate the city um, immediately helping him out. Um, I'm not sure if Josh would like to discuss what had happened, but originally they did have registration in Auburn. It was done regularly. I've been part of this cleanup with him for a few years now and we are now going to have everything over here in Lewiston, the registration, and hopefully next year a bigger event once we get this moving. But this is a great way to get people out there cleaning up our riverfront on both sides of the river. I agree. Thank you very much, Josh. I have uh, registered. Um, you'll see me for at least an hour. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to head to public comment in a second. But uh, Further comment from the council? And now we're going to public comment. <clears throat> Hi, Josh Renee Jean, Ward 1, representing Andrew Scoggin Land Trust. If this had been the first agenda item, you wouldn't have heard from me on anything else. Uh, but um, <laughs> just, to, just to let you all know, um, the staff and administration have been absolutely wonderful uh, in the conversations about using uh, the space near Samard Payne Park. Um, whatever your decision is tonight, um, I think that the improvements that have been done downtown um, and the continuing effort in order to make that area usable um, is, is what's drawing people to want to use that space. With having uh, the boat dock there, it's going to be very easy for people to launch uh, canoes and, and, and kayaks in order to do river cleanup. And it's right before the Dempsey Challenge. So maybe we can get some of that stuff that otherwise Public Works would be looking to grab. Um, next year, we'll come to you in March um, with our requests. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your time, and, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to the council. Found, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. And uh, we have already handled agenda item number 19, so we're moving to 20. Item number 20, appointment of a housing committee member representing a financial institution. Requested action to appoint Don Collins as a Lewiston Financial Institution representative to the Housing Committee for a three-year term, said term to expire January 1st, 2023. May I have a motion? So moved. 
Councillor Harriman, seconded by Councillor McCarthy. Um, yeah, I'll just say that I spoke with um, uh, Don Collins, and uh, yeah, she's excited uh, about the possibility of serving. Discussion from the council? Uh, public comment? Back to the council. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor from Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Uh, reports and updates from the council. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. I'll try to make this quick. I got a couple of things to report for the school committee and a couple other committees, please. Um, with the school committee, the last school committee meeting was last week. We um, hired a new assistant principal at Montello School. We did fill the um, ELL director's position with an interim director. Um, let's see here. The superintendent gave us a year update at the beginning of the school year. Unfortunately, we still are in need of ed techs and special education teachers. I will report also that there has been a conversation around some of our busing situation. I had reported to you last time that we had originally been short 19 bus drivers. We were able to fill many of those positions, but we are still short a couple of bus drivers. And one of the conversations that are happening, and I'm going to probably have a request a conversation with you, Heather, in regards to this, and that's in respect to the buses that are being used for St. Dom students. There are currently 40 students that are using the buses for, to, be, to go to St. Dom's, while we have 275 Lewiston Public School students that don't currently have a bus. That was a contract and a decision, I believe, that was made in 1961, is what I heard from the superintendent, and I was like, 1960, was it that long ago? I didn't think it was that long ago myself, so I need to find out a little more information on this, but I wanted to put it out there that we are starting to have this conversation. And I don't remember the year if you knew what that was, Heather. They voted initially and then they had they reaffirmed it in like 20, 2001. Yeah. 2001. 2001. A public vote, a citizen referendum public vote. Oh, okay. Yes. But I will clarify that St. Dom's uh, at the high school level um, pays for their uh, right. busing. I I'm still looking to have a further conversation with the superintendent on this in the school committee and possibly have a conversation here at the city council on that as well. Um, the city, the school committee adopted our 2022-2023 um, calendar and then we had a unanimous vote to approve policy JICJ which is the student use of cell phones and other electronic devices. We thought and expected there to be quite a bit of conversation around that. We actually had nobody come to public comment on that. We did have a lot of responses back from a survey that was sent out and the overwhelming response was from parents was put it in place. So we'll see where it goes from there. Um, we also had a reallocation of funds for some unfilled ed tech positions to work on a pilot program that's gonna help students that are currently not reaching the level of graduation and having them hopefully see how that might work. I asked the superintendent if we were going to do this, that we have a regular update on this program to see how it is working if we're gonna move forward with this program in the future. Um, that was it on the school committee report. I'd also like to report that the Houston Youth Advisory Council is meeting tomorrow night for their first meeting at 530 and that the Senior Advisory County Council is meeting next week for their first meeting on September 13th. Thank you. Uh, any other updates from uh, members of the council? Um, new, uh, it's a new business, Madam Clerk. Uh, any other business counselors or staff may have relating to Lewiston City Government? Seeing none, we'll move to the next agenda item. 
uh, agenda item number 23, executive session pursuant to main revised statutes annotated Title I, Section 4056C, to discuss an economic development issue of which the premature disclosure of the information would prejudice the competitive bargaining position of the city. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Councilor McCarthy, seconded by Councilor Pease. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Council from Ward 2? Yes. 3? Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Uh, good night, Lewiston. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>